It's Friday, Brzezinski, Braun, Kratz. Can we just get right to this? Or do you have anything special besides subscribe, podcast, notifications, Foul Territory Shop is going to have a new item coming up soon. You good? You ready? Was I supposed to have something today? No, I don't want you to. I just wanted to get right to business because no, I feel like this good. is going to take some time. We no, I'm good, good today. today too. I mean, uh, I know. It should be a happy day for a lot of people. True. After so, the news yesterday that broke. Why don't we charge the damn mound right from the jump here and get to the commissioner's comments? And there were many, but I think the one that we should start with is that this will be his last term now. Term is five years. It's not like it's happening tomorrow. Exactly. So he made it official that he's done January of 2029. Mm. And a classic quote from a guy that I've spent a lot of time with at nightclubs and raves. You can only have so much fun in one lifetime. I have been open with them, the owners, about the fact that this is going to be my last team. I actually have been to a few events with the commish, Kratz, and I'm being sarcastic. He is not a 10 on the fun scale. He was fine. We, we got along. We had some good combos. Obviously, he's a super smart guy. I think there's no doubt about that. Feel meter low, and I think for a lot of people, they thought this was going to say 2025 or 6. 2029, who the fuck knows what's going on in 2029? That's a long ways away. They have a deadline. When we're going to get our expansion in, when all this stuff, so he can have his mark on what's happening. So 2029, what I want to know is who's who's the next to start buttering the bread of the owners to be like, hey, I want to be the commissioner. Theo, can we say Theo? We got a lot of questions from people on all the socials sending us notes. And the one name that surfaced often was, is Theo next? I mean, I, for a while, I would thought it would have been Costas, who we're going to have on later. But I think that Theo is a name that... That's probably, why I wanted to ask Bob. Pops out. Um, when does the CBA expire for MLB? In a few years. He's got to work another one. Uh, yeah. So he, he's going to he's gonna get through that, probably have a round of expansion after the A's move, get the A's thing settled. It's 26, I think. And then he has all the stuff with, uh, you know, signing deadline, this deadline. So good, he's, good you know luck. what he's going to do? He's going to just completely try to destroy the union before he goes out is what it looks like. If I mean, depending on what it is. Is that what you want shot? your legacy to be, though? Like, do you want your legacy to be, oh, I'm crushing my enemy and I'm making money for all my billionaires? Or do you think there's a slice of care about public legacy with the other, you know, trillion plus people that care about the sport and that really should be looked to as the the root of our sport, right? Which is fans, which are normal human beings and not billionaires who sneeze 500K into their tissues. You know what I'm saying, Kratz? Like, do you feel I, like there's a slice of care where there might be a decision or two, even if it's not until 2028, where he goes, you know what? I think this is better for the sport. Because I know most of the time his job is to work for the owners, think yep. short term, and get anything done that makes an extra penny now versus later. But do you think there will be a slice or two? Because the one thing that you can take a pro out of, in my mind, from his entire tenure, is the rule changes this past season. That was a big win for his Q score in my mind. He wants to make he wants to make one more one more mark on the history. He always taught when he mm-hmm. first got hired in 15, he talked about how Bud Selig changed things in history. That just gives you a precursor of what he wants to do. To me, I think it will be opposite of what AJ said. I think he may take a shot at crushing the union. But ultimately, the end, he wants to make sure the millions upon hundreds of millions of baseball fans out there know that he helped the game, not the 30 owners. So to me, I think he's going to hedge his bet and he's going to make some more pro player moves. Mm. 
You had me until the last. I'm just pro player words. moves. Not not, not pro, pro player. Pro, pro game. Pro game. I'm sorry. Not mm. pro. Ne- it'll never be pro player. No. Pro game. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's interesting because he's going to want to leave on a positive note. But there's also, if you know, let's say there, you know, from, according to people you talk to, there's a good chance there's another work stoppage in 26 when the CBA is, because of people are going to want what he said. They were going to want a free agent deadline. They're going to want all that stuff in the off season. And then they're also going to want more than likely a cap. And then they're going to get, and then the players are going to say, well, you want a cap. We want a floor. So it's going to be a big, it's going to be a big deal. I think, because I think this might be the one where they think, well, these guys are making too much money. They can't afford to sit out a year. And I don't know this from anybody, but I feel like the owners are preparing themselves right now for that because, you know, they're, you know, looking at it from the outside, slicing salaries, trying to save money here and there. And they, and I think they, they do a lot like the players association does where they take uh, money and put it in like what they call a central fund. Like I know the players do that where they, where players can get money from the central fund when they're on strike or they're locked out. So I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how he goes out because that 26 bargaining is going to be a tough one, especially after the work stoppage he does. And he also doesn't want to be, the commissioner, you know, the, after Seelig went all those years and never had a stoppage, and then Manfred twice is going to have stoppages. So, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what he does and some of these decisions. You know, he's listen for all the grief, we, shit, and grief we give him. He has done some good things. There's been some good moves he's made. The pitch clock has been a, a success for most people. Um, there's been some other things he's done, I think, to help the game. But you know, he's just I don't know. He's he's not well liked by people. And also, let's be real. I mean, football's in its own stratosphere. MLB used to be ahead of NBA, correct? We in agreement on that? I mean, obviously, Jordan was in a world of his yeah. own. Kind of LeBron's in that world for the last 20 years. But has the NBA not surpassed MLB in certain categories where they used to have the lead? And also, does the commissioner of the NBA make our commissioner look incredibly amateur at his job? Out of touch. Yep out of touch because that he is the extension of the ownership. You, you know, I don't know though that every fan knows when you say that MLB commissioner, like, Oh, well, he's the one that puts down all the rules for the owners. And so he's an extension. And if he's boring and out of touch, especially with the comment that he made about the Bay area, it shows that the owners are out of touch as a whole, not as a, not, not as individuals, you know, there's some that are really, really good, but they're out of touch if they make comments and they let him make comments like he's made because that's the people that he hangs around with. Mm-hmm. So let's get to that. There, there's two pieces of the puzzle here. Do you want to do the free agency or the A's, A's. portion? I mean, let's start on the A's because the free agency one to me is, is super interesting. So you want to take more time on free agency? Yeah. Okay, so, let, yeah. so let's do this. Let's talk A's for a moment. Then we're going to get our guest, and then we'll talk free agency a little bit later on. So with the A's, he essentially said that there's another team in the Bay Area. Mm. So A's fans, fuck off and root for them instead. Mm. Wait, but there's more. Our buddy Dave Sampson, who joined us earlier this week, I listened to his show this morning, and he also mentioned some key words about the Vegas proposition. One of them was that the... Site for the ballpark was adequate. It's like, that's not a word you use when you're feeling great. He also used the word confident about everything happening, right? So Samson was pointing out how that is commish and owner speak for me. We'll see what happens. <laughs> it's, he, he goes, if they were fucking crushing it, they would have said, I guarantee this is all good. It is a definite. This is done. He goes, there were no words like that. Confident, that's like during baseball season when you give a vote of confidence to a manager or a closer, and then he a gone. week later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, A's fans, who are you going to root for if the team actually does end up in Vegas? Uh, Rob Manfred has a team for you, mm. and it's the San Francisco Giants. Stop it. Stop that. I want you to turn. You're pointing at him right now. Mm. I want you to turn to your guy right there. No, not me. AJ and say, AJ, the White Sox are leaving Chicago. It's okay. 
Go be a Cubs fan. And mm-hmm. this is not this is a professional baseball player who has mm-hmm. played his almost Hall of Fame career in one in one city where he won a World Series, moved around tons of other cities, and he despises the other team in the city. You cannot sit there and tell an A's fan who are the most dedicated fans that there are, hey, go be a giant fan. Mm. Go, go, go do that. That is so out of touch. So out of touch. Mm. Okay, AJ. No, hell this no. This is your one role play moment. No. You're in Chicago. No. The White Sox <laughs> leave. not happening. I'm a Cardinal fan or a Brewer fan. <laughs> or I think a lot of A's fans are going to root for the Oakland Ballers, which is not a major league team, but they're just going to bring their allegiance to it. They're not going to root for the Giants. Fuck no. Because there's too many people. There's too. I mean, I played for the Giants 20 years ago. Even back then, there was a rivalry between the fans, between the organizations. I mean, I remember driving across the Bay Bridge, and they would there was a big sign before the Giants had won, come see the team that's actually won a World Series out in the Bay Area. <laughs> like, stuff like that, like petty stuff, right? Which is great. But you're not just automatic. Yeah, maybe 50 years from now when, you know, generations have switched over, there might be Giants fans, A's fans have become Giants fans, but over, right? Quickly? It ain't happening. It's like it's like the Mets and the Yankees. If the Mets and the Yankees, the Yankees were like, hey, we're moving to, I don't know, Tokyo, they'd be like, yeah, I ain't rooting for the Mets. I'm rooting for someone else. I'll find another team or just quit watching. Some Yankee fans would move to Tokyo. Well, that's what I'm saying. Are they, uh, yeah. It, it's so out of touch, you know. Is it worse than the piece of metal comment? No, but it, that that was pretty Oof. bad. It actually didn't get as much pub as I thought it would, but that's a rough comment, and it's just not necessary. The one other thing that it brought me back to, because we forget things so quickly, was when they had the boycott game. Do you remember the comments then? Oh, how he many goes, people? Because it was filled, the reverse boycott up? game. He goes, I mean, it was great. It is great to see what is this year almost an average MLB crowd in oh. the facility for one night. That's a great thing. Why do you have to do that? Why do you want to be a villain? There's no reason for that. Say, hey, this is such a shitty situation for a big market of great fans. And I wish that it would, I mean, cause he's got to play the side a little bit. I wish it would have ended up differently, blah, blah, blah. But what a freaking night for them to show support, whatever. Like mm. he, he went so far the other way. Do you know, actually, in the Bay Area, I didn't realize this, but I, I read this this morning. Mike Kruko, who's the Giants broadcaster, mm-hmm. actually has been on the record saying in 2022, replace him. He's got to go. I'm on board with that. If that happens, he's going to fall out of this job and land on his feet. He will be the next villain in the Batman movie, and he'd be a good one. Whoa. Bay Area loves him mm. the most. So anyway, there's a lot of comments that need to stop there. And it's not hard. But it's the people he hangs around with. I'm sorry. Like. You hang around with certain people. You always are talking certain ways. You change your reality uh, or you change what you think is reality. And that's the reality of the people he's having meetings with every single day. No matter how many ex-players he brings on to work for their offices. It's just, it's just the people that he's around and the blindness to the fact that you're taking a team out of the fourth largest market and putting them in the 44th largest market? Yep. It's just... I want both, but... Here's here's the bigger problem I have more than that. It's just... We've talked about this. It's just... It's just been handled so poorly from the beginning. That's it. That's it. There could have been so many other ways. They, they What they should have done, and again, I'm not in the meetings, but they knew their lease was expiring after next year. They go to Oakland before any of this breaks, say, hey, we want to just do a short term because we're exploring other options for a stadium. Let's give us till 28. Give us three more years, 25, 26, 27. Oakland probably would have been like, cool. Then they would have been pissed when they found out they were moving. But at least you have a stadium secure instead of going like, well, we don't know where we're going to play. We just want to move. I don't know. There's there's just so many other ways they could have done this. And then now, like what you said, we, every part, it's weird. Uh, out of all the things we've ever talked about on this show, the one thing almost, I'm going to say 95 to 100% of the people we have talked to about the Oakland to Vegas situation are like, I'm not sure this is going to happen. Like almost every guest that is somewhat of an expert on this whole thing from David Sampson to the Oakland writers we bring on to the Susan Slusser Bay Area, she's more of a Giants person, but like they're all like, I don't know this is going to happen. 
So then what? Let's say that doesn't happen. Now what do you do? Now, now if you're the A's, now what? You go back and you beg Oakland, please take us back. We love John. They're Fisher. already doing that yesterday for, for the three-year deal. And at least paraphrasing from the city official, Lee Hanson, that spoke. They're like, yeah, cool. If you guarantee us another team, you know, or either we get to keep this team and get rid of the owner or give us another team when you do the expansion. You got to guarantee that. And you know that MLB is not going to guarantee that. So to be continued on this, very interesting. And we'll get to some other comments that were made by the commission, including a free agency deadline. Stay tuned. But for now, let's get to the Toronto Blue Jays. Our first guest lined up here on FT Live today. Shai Davidi, who covers the team for Sportsnet, does an awesome job covering this team on a daily basis. Shai, great to have you on and great to see you. And looks nice out there in Dunedin. And we got to start with Eduardo Escobar. And the tee up from one of the fans in our chat was beautiful. He's like, Eduardo Escobar is on a plane to Dunedin. I'm saying, no, he's there already, but just, you know, taking it lightly, which I think is good. And he's a great guy. So what do you know about the signing? Well, it's a minor league deal. It's a flyer. Blue Jays are very interested to see what he looks like. They've heard good reports about the type of work that he's done over the offseason. Obviously, didn't have the type of year we're used to seeing Eduardo Escobar have last year between the Mets and the Angels. And he fits into a very uh, glut-filled Blue Jays infield mix. Uh, He's someone that they would look to uh, to get some reps at third base, someone to get some reps at second base. Uh, manager John Schneider really saying that he's going to arrive as somebody who uh, will be competing for one of the spots uh, in a complementary role uh, at those two positions. It really does right now look like it's sort of Kevin Biggio at second and Isaiah Kiner Falefa at third to get sort of the primary reps. Uh, and then how the other players fit in around it is obviously Davis Schneider, um, who came up at the end of last season and really gave this team a, a critical jolt of energy with some of his home runs and. Uh, some of his production. Santiago Aspinall is a former All-Star, and uh, he's certainly someone who deserves some playing time. Ernie Clement also did a nice job for the Blue Jays coming up uh, when they had some injuries. So uh, it's uh, they've got a lot of options. They've got two young prospects in Addison Barger and Aravis Martinez who could be knocking on the door. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out because the Blue Jays haven't had I would say competition like this and some uncertainty about who's going to man a couple of positions like this uh, in quite a while. Shy, first of all, you're in the new Blue Jays spring training minor league. We couldn't got you a soundproof room where you can go and sit there with like, <laughs> you know, I know you're up in the tower yeah. of power right now, but we could, I mean, they have like That's 7 it. billion rooms in that complex. Right, but they, they only have a few spots where, you know, it can be isolated enough to have a conversation with you and have quality enough internet to, to make sure that it doesn't cut out. And so <laughs> okay. uh, there, there are also some uh, lives happening on the minor league side behind me, so I was keeping an eye on those while, uh, ah, while I was waiting see. to jump, jump on with you Always guys. working, always working. I love it, I love it. All right, you, you mentioned Eduardo Escobar, and you mentioned IKF is going to play third? Like, wouldn't es- doesn't Escobar kind of profile better for third with his power? and the, some of the things he can do, if not someone else. And then why not just bring back Whit Merrifield? Why go out and get IKF if, you know, because no offense to IKF, he's a nice player, but I feel like Whit's bat plays a little better. He's been in Toronto. He enjoyed his time in Toronto. So why IKF over Whit? Yeah, I mean, a great question. I don't know that I have a, a great answer for you. Uh, it, it could be that uh, Kiner Falefa was ready to make a decision at a time that, that Whit wasn't. Uh, I, do, I don't I don't necessarily have more on that for you than that. So, uh, look, I think the way the Blue Jays are set up, uh, they want to have a lot of versatility. They want to have a lot of players who can do different uh, different things on the diamond and match up with opponents in different ways. It's really been a point of emphasis for them, uh, and I think they've gone towards that. Whit Merrifield was uh, a really important player for this team last year. Uh, he did a ton of great things. Uh, on the field, off the field, uh, was the guy who, who posted, was ready and available. His skill set certainly matched up. Uh, and, you know, the Blue Jays made their decision this offseason, and we'll obviously see how that ends up playing out. Is this team better? Did they make this team better, or are they just fine with the status quo? And, hey, you know what? Vladdy really has to step up. Like, we can't do anything about it. Kind of like Ross's, Ross's – uh, comments at the end of the season well it wasn't me like hey the players gotta do it 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's really the million dollar question. And what happened for the Blue Jays this offseason is they took their shot at Shohei Otani. It was probably a low percentage probability of it happening, but you know, you've got a once in a generation opportunity, you know, tr- see, see if you can make it happen. And it didn't. And at that point they shifted mode. So they had this really aspirational start to their off season. We're like, we're going to try to get the greatest player uh, of his generation and maybe of this century. And after that, it was okay. Let's try to maintain the floor on our roster and count on some of the internal changes we're making to our game planning and to our the way our coaching staff functions and the way that, uh, communication is handled internally and count on that to make sure that we're maximizing the talent that we have on our roster in a way that they didn't in 23. And so uh, the bet is that they will be able to get more from the players on this team this season. And if everyone performs the way they should, they, they have in the past, you know, you think you get the best out of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. You get the best out of Alejandro Kirk. You get the best out of Dalton Varsha. All, all of a sudden, this offense looks a lot different. You know, George Springer uh, has a, a se- uh, the type of season that he's capable of having. You know, Bill shit is they just able to avoid injury and just keep on doing what he's done. Uh, this this suddenly becomes a very different offense, a much more productive one. And at that point, in theory, they are better. So, uh, from a talent perspective, it's pretty similar to where they were a year ago. Uh, the Blue Jays would say that. We've had internal growth, internal progress uh, in that regard from our own players, and that makes us better. But the proof of that is going to play out over the coming months. Now, you said they made their best effort at Shohei. They made their best effort to equal what he was given at other places. Shohei would have been the biggest story in two countries, Canada and Japan, and Rodgers would have monetized that to the point where they would have made money off of Shohei Otani, not even talking about him being on the field. Are they willing to be fine with the fact that they didn't get him and then take that $700 million? And they could lock up with that $700 million, Bo Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero. Or do they not think they're worth that money? So uh, in terms of should they be looking to lock up Vladimir Guerrero Jr. or Bo Bichette, I'm on that, yeah, you got to get those guys done because, I mean, it's not just them. If you look at where the way their roster is set up after 2025, it's also Jordan Romano and it's Chris Bassett and it's Eric Swanson and it's Tim Meza and it's Chad Green. I mean, it, it is a significant amount of talent that is expiring at the end of that year. And so that's a, it, it's a real cliff that the Blue Jays are hurtling towards. Uh, but does that necessarily mean that the money that you were going to spend on Otani is suddenly available for other spends? I don't think that's the case because like Shohei Otani for any team, Blue Jays included, I mean, that's a business decision. That's not just a baseball decision. You know, when you, when you sign Shohei Otani, you're almost acquiring an entire ecosystem around him that you're appending to your organization. And for the Blue Jays to have completed that kind of transaction, that wouldn't have just been uh, about baseball. It would have been about all the other pieces that you mentioned for that ownership using him in all kinds of other different ways and using him to leverage other businesses that exist around uh, the Blue Jays. So I don't think that's a parallel. I think that's a unique opportunity. That's a singular case. But from a baseball perspective, can the Blue Jays lock up Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Bo Bichette? Sure. And Look, the clock's ticking on that. I can, you know, the closer you get to free agency, the tougher it is to lock up a player. The, the, the incentive decreases for both those guys. You know, both those guys through Bo Bichette, a structured contract covering his arbitration years, and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. going year, year to year through the system. You know, they will have already made enough money to take care of themselves. So they can comfortably look to try to max out on their next deals. And so... Maybe you need free agency. It makes it all the more difficult, I think, for the team and the player to try and find a sweet spot uh, before the open market comes into play. Shai, uh, you, you, we've mainly hit on the offense here, but for me the key is, is their pitchers, right? So how is, first of all, the biggest question mark of all? How, Alec Manoa, I know he came in, again, best shape of his life. You keep hearing this from a million people. <laughs> but is there is there a competition? And then also, when is their top prospect? Uh, I, I'm going to say his name, Ricky 
Tiedemann? Tiedemann? Tiedemann. Tiedemann. Is Tiedemann. he going to have any chance to make the team? Is there any other pitching battles that we should be aware of there in Dunedin? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, it is uh, that cliche that we know, you know, the best shape of your life and throwing free and easy and all that, all that kind of stuff. But, like, Alec Mano quite literally looks like he's in the best shape of his life. Uh, wow. He's transformed his body. He looks like he got after it in a major way, very clearly that he did. And so the, there's a lot of excitement around that. I think with the – is he in a fight for the fifth starter spot? You look at the way the Blue Jays handled their offseason. I mean, they very clearly made sure that he's got a pathway to that fifth starter spot. And they haven't guaranteed it, but they are very much hoping that he is the guy who takes that fifth starter spot. And if he regains, I mean, he doesn't have to be as good as he was in 22. If he's similar to that, even a bit lesser than that, I mean, that's plenty good enough for the Blue Jays. And knowing Alec Manoa, he is going to be determined to be as good as he was in, uh, in 22, if not better than that, and would like to erase the memory of last season as much as he can from, from, the, from everybody's minds. Uh, but that is going to have to play out. And so uh, the question becomes what happens if he isn't there yet? And I think that's where things get a little bit stickier for the Blue Jays. Uh, you know, they've got Bowden Francis, who was in an up and down role last year and pitched really well. And he's somebody that uh, certainly set himself up uh, to be a guy who could be considered for a six starter spot. Mitch White uh, had an injury. Uh, injury muddled the year, but really came on strong at the end of the year. And he's somebody who could factor in there as well. Ricky Tiedemann is very much knocking on the door. I mean, it's electric stuff. Uh, and talking to someone who saw him pitch in the American, uh, in the, excuse me, the Arizona Fall League uh, back in uh, October, November, just said absolute beast was the description. But the Blue Jays are going to be careful a bit with him. They, they, he's got some fine tuning to do. Uh, he'll eventually be in the mix. So, I think the Blue Jays have more depth this year to withstand an issue should one arise in the rotation. But the way they've set everything up, Alec Minow is there. And, of course, I didn't mention Yarel Rodriguez, the uh, Cuban right-hander who they signed uh, as a free agent. Uh, you know, he didn't pitch last year after appearing in the World Baseball Classic as he was getting over to North America. Uh, he's a bit of a wild card. The Blue Jays do think he'll factor in some way this year but there may be a bit more of a gradual progression with him as they try to stretch him out after he pitched as a reliever uh, most recently in Japan. You said about Manoa being in the best shape of his life compared to 2023 or compared to 2022. And if that's the case, was that his issue? Was that his main issue? Because there's a lot of like, I'm not sure. Is he injured? He's kind of injured. He's not pitching in AAA. Oh, no, no. Now he's definitely injured. We're taking it easy. So what What are we comparing it to? Well, I would say that the time that we've seen him, at least, it, he certainly looks to have set himself up physically to, to be in the best spot he's been in. Uh, and last year, look, there. it's not one thing for him last year, right? It was... He, in 2022, he has this massive jump in innings. He cracks uh, 200 when he factor in the postseason uh, for the first time in his life. And he had a weird buildup because of the pandemic season. And all of a sudden, the year afterwards, he's in the majors and, and hauling innings. Uh, he said himself that he didn't have uh, quite the offseason that maybe he needed uh, at the end of uh, or after 22, 22, getting into 23. He had a good camp, but didn't get his stuff back, Was ended up chasing it, had some mechanical issues. Uh, there are some other things that played out afterwards. Doubt started getting into his head and that rather than being in an attack mindset, he was more thinking about where he needs to be physically, where he needs to be mechanically, all these things that you don't want to be thinking when you're on the mound that you just want to be able to do naturally because you have the confidence that that's going to be there for you. So yeah, I think... He spent a lot of time in speaking to him earlier today, just reflecting on all those different pieces that came into it. He really tried to be goal oriented in the way he uh, prepared himself physically, not just from a strength perspective, not just from a conditioning standpoint, but flexibility, agility, all the different things that he needs to do to get himself into a good spot mechanically to be consistent. And 
he mentioned that he had had a sort of a similar ish kind of experience in college where, you know, he struggled and ended up figuring some things out with his delivery and then really taking off the next year. Uh, Blue Jays, Manoa are obviously hoping for a repeat in this case. And, uh, you know, again, you know, he's, he's done a lot of work. It's that, that part is pretty clear how it translates. You know, we have to wait and see. All right. Who's on the hot seat? Ross Atkins or John Schneider? And before you say this, John Schneider was my first ever roommate in Pro Bowl, so you better be you better be nice. I'm telling him what you say. <laughs> no, no problem. I mean, look, it, it's obvious for everybody, and I know that you would do that too, Kratzy. Uh, yes, I would. <laughs> I, I, th- I think for everybody right now, everybody's on the hot seat, right? Like th- this window that the Blue Jays had that they worked so hard to build. I mean, it's shrinking. Just like I mentioned before, with the number of players who are going to be eligible for free agency uh, in two years down the road, there's some players, uh, Danny Jansen among them, who are going to be hit, eligible to hit the market this offseason. I mean, this group could very much fall apart or disappear pretty quickly. And so the Blue Jays haven't been able to get to where they'd wanted. Uh, you know, they had a good opportunity in 21, finished one game short with a team that was absolutely. Uh, maybe even the strongest that they've had in recent memory, uh, but they just didn't manage to fix their bullpen in time and didn't get into the playoffs uh, by one game. Then in 22, 22, they had the series against the Mariners and the, the terrible game two ending when they collapsed after having an eight one lead. And then last year they have, uh, they get swept again by the Minnesota twins. Like this is a team that knows it hasn't maxed out on what they've built or at least feels that they haven't maxed out on what they've built. And so the, the, oper- the window of opportunity is shrinking. If it doesn't start happening for them, I mean, there has to be urgency because it, once this window goes, it's not like this is a minor league system that's bursting on the scenes with players ready to jump in and carry the load right away. You know, there isn't another Bo Bichette, There isn't another Vladimir Guerrero Jr. waiting in the farm system right now. And so in the absence of that type of talent, if you're not seizing the moment right now, you're not seizing the opportunity you have, uh, you know, change, change is inevitable. Shy, let's finish with this because a lot of fans in the chat are asking about how you think second and third will play out. There's some fans that are pissed that Davis Schneider is not in the mix for a somewhat regular role after what he put together last year. And we saw some good hitting peripheral numbers for him as well. It looks like they're treating him more as a utility. Why can't he potentially be a starting second baseman for them? I think he's going to get a lot of playing time. I think you'll see him a fair bit at second base. I think you'll see him uh, get some reps at, in left field as well, and perhaps some time in DH if Justin Turner's in the field or something along those lines. Uh, I don't think the Blue Jays are running away from David Schneider by any stretch of the imagination, but I really do think they want to have some competition, and they want to say, like, okay, guys, look, we have at-bats available. You guys play for – you guys earn them essentially. And there, there is also the element too, where they do want to be able to mix and match and maybe not necessarily in the traditional left, right sort of way, but okay, this is a day where we're looking for a bit more defense. So how do we line up on that day? Or maybe this is a day where we need a little bit more contact in the batting order. So how do we line up for that uh, occasion? Or maybe we need a, a little bit of uh, you know one swing damage. And so how do we line up for that occasion? So I, I think that's part of the vision. Uh, David Schneider is very much someone that the Blue Jays are looking at in, in, in their plans. Uh, and again, it's just there's a glut of options right now for them. And in the infield, I think the Blue Jays would not be uh, the Blue Jays would not be upset if someone took the job, grabbed it, and said, "Hey, this is mine," uh, and ran with it. Can, Shai, before you let you go, can you just say offense for me a couple times? Offense. Offense, because he said you, you said you went full Canadian with you when you were talking right there. As he should. I love it. I, every yeah, time I love they, it. It makes never gets old. Wait, so it's it's offense in the states? No, it's offense. But you said you went Canadian. Offense. Said offense. I said offense. Oh, yeah. I don't know, man. You said something, yeah, and I was, I was like, there it was, full no, Canadian against. accent the, the, against uh, against yeah. Got to got to. Got to represent Canada at every point, right? Yeah. I agree. You guys say it better than we do, so I'll take it. I agree. I just every time it's like, boom, the O. It's always the O. Always the O that gets you. <laughs> yeah. 
I like it. Well, Shai, really great insight, as, as always. Really appreciate it. It's great to catch up with you. Enjoy the facility there. You'll see one of us at some point in Dunedin make a little stop. So thanks for the time, man. We'll see you soon. All right. Looking forward to it. Good seeing you guys, too. Talk soon. Okay. Talk soon. Thanks, Shai. Shai Davidi. You can follow him at S-H-I-D-A-V-I-D-I on Twitter. He yes, said occasion, I know it's X. I call it Twitter. Occasion. Occasion. Yeah, I like it. It's got it's more... Spelled. Okay. Some more more flavor to it. I know it, 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 it's just yeah, it's just every time you hear the Canadian, you, you never cannot mistake like a Canadian accent when they say it. It is like so easy to oh you're Canadian. Like you can talk to someone and they sorry. And as soon as you hear it, you're like, you're Canada, you're Canadian. Eh? And they're like, What how'd you know? And you're like, hey, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Hoser. I have a story. Hey. So on the move is next, and this is somewhat breaking news. I know it's not earth shattering. But longtime shortstop, Xander Bogarts, is shortstop no more. He is moving to second base for the San Diego Padres. And Hassan Kim, who is a whiz with the glove, is going to play shortstop again for the Pods. Winning move for the Padres? Yes or no? Is this a successful move? There's AJ Casabell, Schilt, manager. Says it's not etched in stone, but for now, Bogarts is at second. Shill had high praise for Bogarts for being so receptive to the idea. It was presented to him in mid-December on Schilt's trip to Aruba. Quote, my admiration for Xander Bogarts went through the roof, Schilt said. And Bill Shaken said in 2021, the Padres signed Tatis to a 14-year contract. He played one more year at shortstop. In 2022, the Padres signed Bogarts to an 11-year contract. He played one more year at shortstop. I mean, true, but I will say right now, Kratz, they have one of the best defenders in baseball in Hassan Kim. And don't you want to put him at the premium infield position aside from what you guys played? Hats off to the to the Padres for doing this. Some teams would look at it saying, shoot, we should have never paid Bogarts what we did for an 11-year contract. We could have find, found a second baseman. This is They're doing what's best for the team. I don't know that they thought – Fernando Tatis was going to be the shortstop of the future. I thought, I think they thought he was going to hit 300 with 30 and 100 every year. Moving into right field, that's a gold glove. That's a gold glove spot. You're not going to spend on pitching. You need a defense to, to be behind them. So I love it. I love it for their defense. And this offense is still going to hit. Like if your defense can help your pitching, which isn't awful pitching, you Darvish, Musgrove, like, they have legitimate pitchers. Michael King? Yeah, Michael King. Sorry, I <laughs> forgot about Kinger. And you have that defense. I think you might get more out of Xander for the next 10 years, too. Well, my question is, what happens when Hassan Kim is a, either traded or a free agent at the end of this year? Jackson Merrill. Do, do you move? You go back to Bogarts and say, well, we, no. we, 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 mm-hmm. or do you, you're going to have to go find another shortstop. Jackson Merrill is a stud prospect who right now they're Isn't he playing around. outfield though. Yeah, but that's not his natural position. Okay, well, he's here's the thing you do though. You don't do with players. You don't move them farther away from the ball. If you think they're going to be there closer to the ball later in their future, but he doesn't have a spot. Doesn't matter. You don't do that because it's so, it's so much easier to move farther away from the ball. Right? So if you're a catcher, it's easier to move to the infield than to the outfield. Right? If you're an infielder, it's so much easier to move to the outfield. What you don't want to have happen, and a lot of teams don't want to do, and if you do this, most teams won't do this, take a kid that was an infielder their whole career and move him to the outfield and then be like a year later say, oh, shit, we were just kidding. We need you at shortstop now. No. What you should do if you're that team is you take that kid and you say you're going to have to go play. It's going to suck in AAA for a year. Get and Hone your skills until we trade Ha Sung Kim, and then you bring him up to play a shortstop. Or he makes it the whole year, and then you say, next year you're our shortstop. But you don't want to have a kid move from the infield to the outfield and then be like, oh, you have to come back. Because they lose that skill set. Yes. Again, the far I think Kratz will agree with me. The farther you get away from home plate, the easier the position is. Is there a chance that A.J. Preller doesn't understand what you just said? I mean, I would hope so. I think Mike Schilt, he was a development guy. He should understand. So maybe that's what's going on right now, Kratz. I mean, they wanted him to try out some outfield. I mean, we also are just getting to camp here. But maybe Jackson Merrill doesn't play outfield for this team. He's also super young, but he projects to be a very good ball player. I mean, I know he's a prospect right now, but this is a first-round pick from a few years ago. Maybe some people can make a case that he's 
too big for the position, but that's not really a thing as much anymore. He's like 6'3", 200. Actually, our friend Kylie McDaniel, who was on the show recently, the comp that he gave, not size, but hitting profile was Ozzy Albies in terms of what he can bring or as Jackson an offensive Merrill? player. Yes. Pretty good Elite player. back control, can get the pitches out of the zone, 2020 threat on a consistent basis, and the glove works almost anywhere. That was the scouting report. So for the future, they're good if Kim leaves. But what about this year? This year, does this make the Padres better? Because they need to improve at the margins since yeah. they didn't get significantly better. In fact, you could make the case that they got worse. Or for me, I think it was kind of even in the offseason because they did get themselves the pitching depth that they needed. Yeah, like I, I think they'll probably be about in the same range as they were last year, which was about 500. Don't get don't get it twisted though. Kim is not a free agent. If I'm if I if I'm reading it correctly, this is the last year of his contract, but he signed a contract. He's still ARB eligible, just like Shohei when he went to ARB after no. his original he's contract. A free agent. No, free agent. Hundred percent. Ninety nine point eight. That's what Scott's saying. Then I believe Scott. Because this is Scott only his fourth. This is only his fourth year, and you can't become a free agent based on how he signed his contract. But we we got to find that out. Either way, they are better. Your question was, are they better? They're better this year. They are better this year, and it might be Preller's last year. You never know. But they're better this year with this lineup, uh, this defensive alignment. Well, they've got nine more years of Bogarts to figure it out. This Where's is going to play. I, my, I think, my thing is they got how many more years of Machado forever with Machado, right? Third, they signed Crone, well, Crone Zone. Crone worth the extension, which six more. wasn't necessary at all at the time. They just did it like, hey, I like this guy. Oh, we're in the Crone Zone, my boy Donnie Orsillo, right? <laughs> like in the Jumbo Jacks, they get every time he hits a homer and Orsillo gets a free something. But uh, it, it's 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 a it's an interesting roster construction they have here. Like, Austin Kim was really good last year. Look at his numbers. And so now you're switching him over to short. Bogart struggled. I know that. But I don't know. It, it, it's Are they better? Yeah, I mean, I think they are probably defensively for sure, yes. range-wise, that whole thing. Absolutely. But you got nine more years of Xander Bogart. You're going to tell me for the next nine years he's going to play second base for you? Yes. Trevor Story. Trevor Story's switching back over. And the issue with Trevor Story was he didn't have the arm strength. So as soon as he went to second, they were like, ah, nope, he's never going to play. Switch back over after Tommy John. So I think I think uh, Andres Jimenez said it perfectly. He's like, it would take a lot. I couldn't just hop back in to play shortstop. He said it would take an entire offseason. And Andres is how much younger than Xander Bogart. So they had to have thought about that. They had to have thought and – planned or maybe they're not planning ahead but this team like you said is going to be around this is this is the team that the Padres have and maybe they feel like they can get a shortstop later or Xander can go back if if Kim leaves but I, I really want to get to the end of it I, I don't think he's a free agent well it says I'm 100% now he is a free agent I did the research while you were talking Okay, tell me it about it. It's not the same as the Otani deal. I don't have all of the details. I don't understand it all. I just have like 10 places that are all saying he is a free agent after this year, which technically is all I care about. He is a free agent after Mark, this season. Mark, our fearless leader. Mutual, Mutual option. Mutual option, which means, which means the Padres free agent. are going to say no. <laughs> or he's going to say no. No, he's going to say no. And they're gonna, the he's Padres gonna would beg agent. yes. Yeah, I mean, Mutual I don't know what the options number is. are fake. Okay. I don't know what the number is, but yes. It doesn't matter what the number is. He's. I'd be he's, interested to see why he's a free agent because he doesn't have the, six well, years. Because he came over as an, as an older player, so they probably made it so he could be a free agent at the end. Correct. Kratz, I can actually kind of answer your question, okay? When he signed with the team, he was already past the age qualification so that he doesn't have to deal with those rules that Otani did, right? Otani, I think, signed when he was, what, 24 or 25? I think the cutoff's 25. And he signed, I believe, when he was 26. So he's no, good. He was twenty. He was twenty-five when he made his big league debut, and I thought, I thought the twenty-five is the cutoff. cutoff. I thought the age cutoff was twenty-six. That's why Yamamoto's so so intriguing. I thought I it was know. either six years in the other professional league or age twenty-six. Anyway, Otani signed when he was twenty-three. By the way, yeah. Um, uh, no, it's twenty-five. It must be. I mean. Okay. He's a free, he's agent. A free agent. He's going to be a free agent. The end of We're he's arguing over yeah, it's something semantics. that he's going to be a free agent pretty much. This yeah. is it. I mean, I mean, I think he has a $2 million buyout. So 
He's going to be a free agent at the end of the year. Yeah, he's going to cash the fuck out. Of course he, he is. He's he was gonna, a five-plus win player. Yeah, he was an awesome player last year. But my question year. is, my, my, my thing is, again, um, what do they do with Bogarts? Like, I love base. I love Xander Bogarts. He was yes. one of my all-time favorite teammates I ever had. He was awesome. Awesome kid. And still love to see him all the time. And he will do whatever it takes. Remember in the 13, he went and played third base for him? Uh, when they when they won the World Series in 13, he went and played third base. Even the next year, he moved to shortstop full-time 14 when I was there. But this, I mean, he just wants to win. And, and okay. I, I guarantee you, when he signed that deal with San Diego, he's like, we got Soto, we got Machado, we got Darvish, we got Snell, we got Cronenworth, we got Kim, we got Tatis. He also got way more money offered by them than any other team. Well, good for him. I never, right. never fault the guy for getting more money. But totally agree. Then they went out and sucked last year. And he's like, well, okay, if, if me moving to second base will help this team win, he moved his ass to second base. Okay, so StatCast range, out to above average, was a three, plus three, 81st percentile. That's great. Arm strength was 24th percentile. Sounds like a great move to second base to me. Or maybe he just wasn't slinging it. Maybe he doesn't need to. I, I, I don't know. I think it's great. It makes sense. Totally. Hassan Next year, they need a shortstop. <laughs> Jackson Merrill, dude. Okay. You, he's one of the top prospects in the sport. You've got to give him a chance. Not every team has a top 20 prospect on basically every list who's a shortstop who is already pretty close to cracking the big leagues. I know? agree with that. Also, they might don't... resign him. Who, so Kim? Why, why are you guys yeah. so worried about Bogart's long term? He's going to play second base. It's, that's, right. that's, that's fine. fine. But I'm, uh, again, I'm just saying Jackson Merrill playing the outfield. Again, I, I mean, you can you guys can argue with me all you want. You just don't see that happen very much. Or a guy's an infielder, like I played with Michael Kadire coming up, right? He played third base, made a ton of errors. Guess where the Twins are? They're like, you're right fielder, mm -hmm. right? I mean, then they tried to bring him back to second base for a little bit, didn't really work out. Guess what? Go back to the outfield and hit, right? So that that's the thing because once because as as a player, as a former player, and I saw this, once you take if a guy comes up as an infielder and you take that infield away from him. It's kind of a, li a little bit of a blow to him at first, like Alex Gordon, right? He played third base. He wasn't very good. They put him in left field. He was a gold glove defender out there in one World Series, right? And then they were like, well, we can't put him back at third base. It it it's a little bit of a hit. And I think, Eric, you would agree with me, just whether it's confidence-wise, ego-wise, whatever you want to call it, it's just a little bit of a, oh, shit, why did they move me away from the, yeah. where I was? I don't think They've never not played that position. That. They've never not played that position. Mm-hmm. All right, ready for our next guest? Coming back to the show after a few months. Great to have our friend, the legend, Bob Costas, joining us. Bob, great to see you. Oh, wow. We're in a different spot, and it is an immaculate reception. Well, yeah, after much trial and error. Why is it <laughs> that to be on with you guys and the sainted Claudia talking me through it, I need a graduate degree from MIT? <laughs> Why is it so difficult to connect with you guys? I figured you had an honorary degree from MIT, but at this point, you have an honorary degree from every other <laughs> Ivy League school in the world. <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm in I'm in Indianapolis uh, at the NBA All Star Game, uh, and just uh, finished interviewing Larry Bird and raced back to the hotel at your request, AJ. So you guys better raise your game because I just finished with Larry Legend. Wow. Oh, wow. Did he have Whoa. long shorts on or super small tight shorts? Because that's all that really matters. <laughs> he, was hey. in, he was in actual street clothes. So. Oh, okay, good. Did well, you Have you been to uh, St. Elmo's yet? I have to ask. Mm. No, that that is on tap tomorrow night. Oh, shrimp cocktail in the New York Strip. Oh, man. And, oh, uh, whatever the drink classic. is, the special drink they have there. That's like a yeah, cherry I, Coke thing. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't ring the bell for me. But the shrimp cocktail and the steak does. St. Oh. Elmo's since 1903. Well, yep. Bob, we are beyond honored, for real, that you told yeah, Larry, okay. got to go and talk to Pierzynski. Yeah. So let's get right to base. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 he, yeah. And, and he said, huh? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you think yesterday about the commissioner saying that he's going to step down after this term? And I know you're really good at evaluating legacy. What do you think it currently is and what can it be? Well, there are a few things on the table that have to be worked out. Um, I think it's all, it's always a good thing for somebody not to hang on too long. Um, he's been there quite a long time. You know, he was the uh, the main 
counsel to the commissioner's office when Selig was the commissioner. So he's been an important player in baseball for decades now. Uh, there's probably expansion to 32 teams and therefore realignment of the divisions. That's probably on his docket. Uh, resolving the Oakland situation one way or another. Um, and when does the next uh, collective bargaining agreement come up? Seems like it was just, a, yes, just yesterday that they got that in the rearview mirror, but it comes back again uh, pretty quickly. So if that overlaps the end of his term, that, that's something he'll have to work out. Or if he's lucky, he's just handing it to someone else as he walks out the door, because that is always a pain for the commissioner. Aren't you supposed to be the next commissioner? That was like the uh, rumor forever that Bob Costas yeah. is going to be the next commissioner of baseball. Do it. You know, that was that was knocking around in the 1990s and the early 2000s, and I never added any fuel to that fire. I always flatly said, I am not qualified. I am not interested. Just take my name out of the conversation. But it's very flattering that people mention it at one time or another. But was, was there I'm anything not properly else? qualified. You are with your uh, honorary degree from Ivy League schools. You're more than qualified. Trust uh, me. <laughs> what? Was there anything you, else you know what? Saw? I, all the backroom, all the backroom finagling and arm twisting and all the politics of it. <laughs> God bless anybody who wants to do it and is good at it. Yeah, for 40 <laughs> million a year, I might take that job. Uh, but, <laughs> True. <laughs> but was there anything else he said that caught your eye? Because we talked about the A's and how the A's situation, he was kind of like, well, you know, mm -hmm. we're confident it's going to happen and it's acceptable where the A's stadium is going to go. And then also he kind of talked. And we're going to ask you this also about the uniforms. You talked about the uniforms. They're like, ah, eh, the players will get used to them. Screw them. What's, what's with the new uniforms? I'm out of the loop here. Oh, so that everyone hates the new uniforms. The letters, like, instead of being, like, this big, are all, like, this big. And they're, they're instead of being stitched on, they're glued on. The Cardinals, you'll this will get you. The Cardinals red is a different shade. There's, there, oh. there's a lot of people complaining, like, they can't get their jersey. Oh, no made custom right. pants. No custom pants. You know how important that is. Ugh. Oh, this 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 could cause uh, quite a kerfuffle here. Um, yes, it has, <laughs> especially 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 if it's the traditional teams. And, and I haven't seen it. I'm kind of out of the loop. Uh, I guess the commissioner must have had a press conference today, which I uh, yesterday entirely. Is yeah. not, is, That's when he announced that, that he you know was going to step down. But obviously, there were some other things brought up. There's the the difference yeah. in the left side versus you know, the right side. Well, just. Just uh, back to the uniforms for a second. If you're a Tiger fan, <clears throat> pardon me, and that old English D goes away, if they fiddle with the Yankee pinstripes, if they fiddle too much with the birds on the bat in St. Louis, uh, there there will be a rebellion. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. But, I mean, they, there are certain ones that are just you can't mess with. And they already they yeah. did change the Yankee road uniform though this year. They made it like 1950s or something where they took off the yeah. things on the sleeve and they made it. So, I mean, you know, they maybe they were ahead of their time. They knew they were going to these different looking ones. So the Yankees like, yeah, we're just going to get ahead of it and make ours look like that anyways. Yeah, back to the old road grays that I remember when I was a really little kid. Uh, the Yankees of the 50s and early 60s had those distinctive gray uniforms. And the Yankees were always resistant to putting the names on the back of a uniform. The number, yes, and the pinstripes, and that's it. Hey, Bob, how do we fix the offseason slog at times? I mean, sometimes this doesn't happen, but there's the stare down right now with the Boris clients and the teams. And I will say yeah. this because it's a pretty easy one to sum up from, from yesterday. The commissioner said that they proposed a deadline that would happen somewhere in December for free agency. And obviously the PA and the agents were like, no chance that'll bring our, our prices down and that will restrict us. So I don't think that's necessarily going yeah. to happen, but I think we can all agree that when we still don't have a lot of free agents signed, it's not great for the sport. And of course, for business of the teams, they can't market players for ticket sales. Yeah. Well, maybe they could uh, arrive at a middle ground here. Like let's say February 1st, uh, the players wouldn't want December. That's very, very quick. And it probably would uh, hurt some of the bidding that people like Boris are skillful at. Let's see if we can get a little bit of a thing going, this team, that team. Uh, but by February 1st, uh, teams want to know what's what's coming to spring training with them. And like you said, they want to be able to market to their fans. So maybe February 1st is a good compromise. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair. I can't uh, argue with that. Yeah, that gives them more time. Th yeah. That's definitely more reasonable. December's way December's too soon. December's crazy. That's, yeah. I was, that's insane. Guys, I, I apologize. I was traveling yesterday, and it wasn't a direct flight. I had to connect in Phoenix to get to what? Indianapolis. 
Um, and so I was completely out of the loop. I should have no checked problem. to see if there was any big baseball news in the last 24 hours. And now here I am failing you. But it's no, a no, nice no. hotel room and a nice I, backdrop. I'm just shocked you don't have a private jet. That's what I'm wondering about. <laughs> it, it exists at times, I'm sure, in, in the right case. I'm just confused by that. Like, the private yeah, I, I do have... There, there have been times, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Bob, okay, I have one for you that's news from about almost a week ago that I okay. feel like you've probably caught, and it is so up your alley. Uh -huh. Baseball in the Olympics in 2028 has to happen, yes or no? Has to happen in the United States. Baseball and softball, both Los Angeles Olympics, absolutely has to happen. With MLB players? Well, you know, Manfred has mentioned that from time to time. Uh, you have to pause the whole season, um, and you, you're going to have to figure out a way. It can't be the full breadth of the Olympics. You've got to make it pretty tight. Um, you know, hand, maybe, maybe you play it out over four or five days. And it's no, and maybe maybe there's no All Star break that season. There's ways to accommodate it, but it can't be the whole fortnight plus that an Olympics is because that's too big of a disruption within a 162 game season. But could they accommodate it? I think they could. Yeah, well, the the plan they're saying was five or six days, lose the All Star game, or do the All Star game in L A. around the Olympics, but yeah. have guys in mid, and only have like six or eight countries in yeah. it to make it to where you can abbreviate right. it. And I'm all for it. I want to see this. I mean, listen, I want to see the best players. And every player we talk to say, hey, if it was in the middle of the season and I'm up and running and ready to go, I'd have a much easier time saying yes to it. And I agree. Like, mm -hmm. this would be awesome for the game. Yeah, if you if you take care of the logistics, as you just laid out, if you take care of the logistics and you compress it, uh, sure, we want everybody to have a chance, but let's, let's compress it, give the United States and one or two other com countries an automatic buy into the semifinals or whatever it is, then you can probably pull it off. Mm -hmm. Got it. Are you, speaking of Los Angeles, you're calling Dodger games this year? Is that your plan for this year? Uh, no. <laughs> I just do a handful of games for the MLB network, and I do a handful for TNT or TBS uh, when Brian Anderson is busy with the NBA playoffs in April and May. And it just turns out that the first three, four games I'm doing happen to be in Southern California. I'm doing Otani's, First game at Dodger Stadium on March 28th against the Cardinals. Um, and then a couple of Giants-Dodgers games the next week and a Cubs-Padres game after that. So that, that actually works out well for me logistically because in the winter, I'm in California. And right now, if you haven't figured it out, AJ, for me, everything is about my personal convenience. That's pretty much what it is. It's pretty much what it is. Hey, I, I, I feel like you you've heard. You want to pay me three times as much to go to Houston? But, but I can stay home, and I'm, I'm good with staying home. Yep. So, so you are becoming a Dodgers announcer. It's okay. We get it. We get it. Are, are you going to root? Are you going to root? Wait. So, and again, don't give me you don't root. I know you do. Are you going to root for the Cardinals or the Dodgers when you're calling that game? Because, you know, every every national announcer, you know, root, yeah. loves one team and hates. Wait, they love each team, but they hate you each know, team, depending on who you talk just, to. Just talking to, with Joe Buck about this recently, every network announcer knows this. And everyone will tell you, with very few exceptions, we root for a good game. We root for a good storyline. If but one inside, team wins the first the two of a best of seven, you want the other team to come back and make it interesting. So, you know, Otani is going to be the big story. It's not going to be a perfectly normal broadcast because Otani is going to take up a lot of the oxygen. But the Cardinals, of course, are kind of a national team. And they had an off year last year, and they seem to have improved their chances this time around. So... Uh, there's storylines with those two teams. What what you dread as a national announcer is teams that don't really have that much that has broad national appeal. Uh, in this case, we're okay. All right. You're at the NBA All-Star Game. A great mm -hmm. spectacle, a great league that is kind of passing MLB by. What's the difference between Adam Silver and Rob Manfred in the stuff that they could that they one does better than the other one? You know, I'm not dodging it. I, I don't know that I've given this enough thought, uh, comparison of the two. You know, in truth, um, the NBA may have more marketing sizzle, you know, with LeBron and Steph Curry and others. They may have more marketing sizzle. But when you think of the cumulative attendance at Major League Baseball games, the cumulative eyeballs over the course of a season, uh, the playoff ratings, 
You know, this isn't the Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson era for the NBA, despite the presence of Jokic and Doncic and and Curry and LeBron and and Giannis and, and everybody else. This is their ratings have actually been a, a big fall off from the past generation. It's just that baseball seems to be held to a higher standard. Every time baseball doesn't match what it used to be, oh, it used to be the national pastime and now it's not anymore. You know, apples to apples, I don't think baseball is behind the NBA. Everybody and everything is behind the NFL. Not just everything in sports, everything in American entertainment is be behind the NFL. And nothing, that none of the issues that the NFL confronts, especially the very nature of the game and CTE, a lot of people just make their peace with that. Yeah, we know. Okay. We, we want our football and we want to bet on our football and we want our Taylor Swift and, you know. They've got a lot of football's got a lot of advantages. You only play one game a week. It televises well at a time of the year when most people aren't outside because it's fall and winter. And every playoff game is the equivalent of a seventh game in hockey, basketball, or baseball. We know how high a seventh game rates as compared to one through six. They've got that going for them. Then they got two weeks between the conference championships and the Super Bowl. It's one game, one day, and everybody can point toward that. Not like the World Series. Oh, last night, game six. Now it's 3-3. Tomorrow there's a game seven. You know, there's just built-in advantages for football. And I think that people compare baseball how it used to be. Back in the day when game seven and 86 in the World Series between the Red Sox and the Mets got like four times the rating of Monday night football. And that was Giants against Washington. Those days are gone. But I don't think that baseball is in a deficit position, only only when compared to football, I guess. What if you sat down with some St. Elmo's shrimp cocktail with yeah. Rob, Mr. Manfred, yep. what would you encourage him to do to grow the game? You know, I think they're doing a lot of things that are the appropriate things to do. Uh, they're reaching out to kids. Uh, the last draft had more American-born black players in it than in recent history. I think that's a good thing. They're doing all the marketing that they can in, in that respect. Uh, a couple of things I've mentioned wouldn't be so much about growing the game, but improving the game. Now that the pace of play has been dramatically improved and everybody seems to like it, there's no reason to put a ghost runner on second base in the 10th inning play at least one inning of straight baseball, if not two. I understand that managers and front offices don't want marathon games anymore because of the way you handle modern pitching. But the very fact that they don't use the ghost runner in the postseason indicates that they know it's kind of gimmicky. And it made sense when they did it. It was during COVID. They wanted to get the players off the field. Games were dragging on three and a half hours. Now none of that applies. So I would say play at least one inning that way, um, straight before you put the ghost runner on base. And the playoff format, I think, can be tweaked. It takes a little while for me to tell you, and you may be running out of time, but if you have two minutes, I could give you my tweak. Mm. Well, I, I mean, you know what we'll do, Bob? We'll have you back on, because that way you okay, have to promise you'll come back on with us. And, and so yeah. we have, I have two more questions for you before, before okay. we let you go. One okay. is, what's your, you, we asked you this last time, what was your favorite call you said of all time? Your, your favorite game you ever called? That, that I did? Yes. Um, you know, the favorite regular season game is the Ryan Sandberg game. The Sandberg yeah, game. Said, I thought you said the Jordan. 84. I thought you said the Jordan game, the last Jordan game was your favorite one, right? Yeah, they're, they're both they're both connected to Chicago. Um, you know, that was such an epic ending to one of the great careers in the history of sports. You couldn't have scripted it any better. I was I was lucky enough to call Derek Jeter's last at bat at Yankee Stadium. But the championship wasn't on the line as dramatic as that was uh, for Jeter with the walk off hit. Uh, the Jordan thing brought everything together, but confining it to baseball, regular season Sandberg, it'll be 40 years this June. And I know they're going to roll out all the highlights from that. And in the postseason, uh, 97 world series Marlins and Cleveland went, uh, to a seventh game and the seventh game went to extra innings with a lot of strategy involved. So you can't ask for more than that. Okay. So the Jordan game, who was your partner? Doug Collins and Isaiah Thomas. Okay, so did you watch, you watch the Super Bowl, obviously, because you mentioned Taylor yep. Swift. Yeah. What would you have done if, if when Jordan goes and he pushes off, Brian Mitchell makes the shot and he stands there, and Doug Collins was like, over talks over you. You're like, and Jordan, and then Doug Collins jumps in and like Tony Romo did to 
Jim Nance in the Super Bowl. Jim Nance <laughs> is like trying to set it up. Tony Romo's like, well, look, the cheerleaders are on the field and the this yeah, and that. Yeah. And then Jim Nance's like, and there's a touchdown. You know, I, I really like Tony. I think everybody who knows him does. Uh, exuberance is good. Sometimes you have to hold yourself in check. I always have said to the people I work with, and I feel this way when I'm watching a game on television. Let's say it's five seconds to go inbounding from half court in a one point game in basketball. And then the analyst is telling you three different things that at that point, even John Wooden wouldn't be interested in because all that matters is the drama of these five seconds. Get out of the way so that the play by play guy has enough time, not only to let it breathe, but also to set it up and the call there. It's the call that matters more than the analysis over time. The analysis is very important over the course of the full game. But when you get down to the great moments, think about it this way in baseball. When you get down to the great moments, we hardly ever hear the analyst or color man. You hear the play-by-play man. You hear Vin Scully. You hear Jack Buck or whoever it might be. Those are the, the calls that kind of resonate down the corridors of time. So the idea is when the whole thing is at stake, give it to the play-by-play man. But thinking back to that moment, I called the shot. There was still five seconds to go. And then when the replays came on, Doug and Isaiah talked about it. And then I took it back again and tried to put it into some kind of historical context. And then there was still five seconds to go. And there was enough time for me to say to Doug Collins, okay, coach, what do you do if you're Jerry Sloan? That's the way it should be. It isn't a matter who gets to talk more. It's a matter of who should talk when. Agreed. Agreed. Sometimes you just got to shut up as the analyst. That's why you play by play, guys. (laughs) You fly on private jets, and I fly on Southwest. I get it. It's cool. It's cool. But here's it's the cool. thing, AJ, here's what you have to know. Anytime I've had a private jet, I let everybody get on the plane. Oh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to leave Ron Darling in Houston and, and take off on my <laughs> What I kind love of teammate it. I love would it. I be? Uh, in, it's fact, true, right? in fact, when I have been lucky enough to have that, then, then everyone, they practically carry me out of the ballpark on their shoulders and they dub it Air Costas. So, I love it. There you go. I love it. I love it. Hey, you know what the best friend is? One that has a private jet that lets you ride with them. So that's great. great. All right. So last that's thing. Fact. Last thing. So our, yeah. you mentioned your colleagues. Well, one of our colleagues, Ken Rosenthal, texted me this morning and he said, yeah. oh, too bad you're not on today because you're having Bob Costas on. I just want him to know I'm taller than him. And since he's in Indianapolis, I would love to take him to the hoop and dunk on him. So I'm just going to let you have your time. And he said you would get all over it. So we, here's, we have here's your arena. Through, we have been through this before. Kenny Rosenthal is a giant of baseball media. And Kenny Rosenthal is five foot five. In fact, I think he showed his driver's license once on MLB Network and it said five four. You know, here's my feeling. If you're five four and a half, no one wants to hear the half. Round it up. Okay? So I'm five six and a half. I round it up. To five seven, right? <laughs> that's what that's allowed. Now, if I was if I was five six and a quarter, that would be a lie. Okay, but either way, either way, the guy who's getting posted up in this pickup game, <laughs> approaching a geriatric pickup game in my case, but in this pickup game, I'm posting him up, not the other way around. Okay, I just he, he listen. He literally te- I can I show Scott the text. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievable. He literally was like, "Oh, you're not on. Too bad. You can have Costas make fun of me and how I'm." you know, taller than him. And I was like, whoa, I am on actually. And he's like, oh, there you go. You're welcome. Uh, perfect. Oh. Wait, it's the other way. Looks like Ken posted him up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think he got a phone call. <laughs> posted his phone up. Uh, Good right. timing though. And he, yeah, it's perfect. He, I know he had to jump. Yeah. he Listen, he's the best. That was fun. You know, he, he, he knows, he knows baseball, man. He, he knows baseball. He knows the ins and outs of like, well, stuff. And he's been, he's seen a lot. Got, and he's got a lot of, you know, friends and insight that helps to tell the story. That's always important, too, for people to realize. To make informed opinions, if you're able to talk to people behind the scenes, it helps. Agreed? He's not a yes, he's not a yes man. He's very, like, he does a good job of, like, putting his... He has so much experience, too. Like, his, his shtick on something. I, I, I could just listen to him talk forever. Sometimes I get lost in listening to him talk and I forget I'm supposed to ask him a question. Okay, so let's get our own take on the free agent signing deadline that was thrown out there because you have Manfred talking about it and, of course, a comment from Scott Boris. Deadlines are death lines to the players. (laughs) It's a death of their right 
because a player goes all that time to earn that right to become a free agent. It's an artificial reason not to get your value. Teams cannibalize deadlines. Everything they would do would be around the deadline. I'll wait and get this value at this time because I have a deadline rather than what's the player worth. In my mind, nailed it. That's true, okay? There's two reasons for this, okay? One is to try and drive prices down. Two makes sense to me. Two. Two makes sense to me. Business. Fans want to know who they have going into this season. It plays to the excitement. Once spring training comes around, which is now, it's not the same. The coverage of the story, not the same. The season ticket sales, not the same. So even the marketing preparation of photos and all of these things that go into books and posters and everything else, right? It's not going to be there if on March 12th, the Giants signed Blake Snell, the reigning Cy Young winner in the American League. That part does suck. There's just, in my mind, not a solution that's going to be approved by both sides. So the moral to all of this is nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Nothing's going to happen. This is all, all posturing. It's all posturing Obviously. for the CBA. Always both, both teams. Up. Both sides. Of course. Of course. But it's, you know, when the commissioner comes out and says this, everyone hears this is like, oh, this is a great idea. They're going to get this. No, they're not. They're not going to get that because, the, again, the Players Association is going to have to approve it. It's not going to happen. Dude, they rejected it so hard. Of course they did they, right away. They matumboed it. They were like, no, 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 yes, no, no, no. they were like, absolutely not, a as expected. But here's the other thing, though. I will say this, that, you know, we just talked to Bob Costa. He was talking about the NBA and the NFL. They do do this a lot of times. Like, they do a big thing when free agency hits. Baseball doesn't really do it. And now the reason people are calling for this is because you look up and you got four of the top free agents that haven't signed. Chapman, Bellinger, Snell, Montgomery, right? They haven't signed. We're Again, we're February 16th. All the teams have reported. All the teams are in camp. Games start like next week. Do you really think those players aren't going to play ball this year? I, I do, but it just it still sucks when you have it's crowds. You know, guys that come in late, they usually just I don't know. It messes up the timing of everything. It just doesn't. It, it makes for everyone's rushed. Oh god, we got to get this guy ready so fast, you know. And then and then if they don't get off to a good start, everyone's like, well, see, he didn't sign on time. So okay. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It just th – that's why this is even brought up is because those guys haven't signed. And then you get Scott Boris piping in on it, as he should, because they're his clients. And, of course, he wants more time because then he can try to get every dollar. Yeah, but, Kratz, when you wait this long and now spring training is starting, here's what I think Boris thinks could happen. On the pitching side, oh, shit, Kyle Bradish is hurt. Might need TJ, right? It's not official yet, but obviously he's got a UCL issue. So if that popped up in a few weeks, no one would be surprised. Also, when guys show up to spring training, it's a little bit of, oh, he looks better. He's got better velo. He's in better shape. But it's also a lot of, oh, there's an arm issue. He's going down his shoulder. There's a UCL issue. So a big contender with deeper pockets could have a problem in the next couple of weeks. And that could cause them to pick up the phone and have more of a conversation on the other side with position players, owner checks in with GM. How do they look? Eh, they look okay. We probably could use a bat. I mean, you've already made it this far. Now you actually get to see the product that you have in spring training. It could lead to a little more money being pushed across the table. Agree besides, or disagree? Besides the injury part, I completely disagree. You're not signing somebody to fill in a spot. These four guys that are coming are perennial all-stars, perennial gold glove winners, Cy Young winners, World Series champion. Like, you're not you're not getting this guy. Oh, okay, we got to panic and get Blake Snell. Now, there could be a case where Zach Wheeler doesn't want to sign the extension in the next week and the Phillies are like, all right, that's fine. We're going to lot that money to Blake Snell. Scott, how much for Blake Snell? We're going to bring him in this year. Taiwan Walker's the odd man out for a little bit. And then we have Blake Snell for the next six years because Zach Wheeler doesn't. Injuries, like we're not panicking and picking up Blake Snell because Kyle Bradish is out, whether the Orioles were going to spend or not. Okay, the Yankees made an offer to Blake Snell. What if Cole got hurt? You don't think that they would pick up the phone again? 
with everything that they've invested into this coming season? Maybe the Yankees. Maybe. All right. Like, so I'm bringing up some examples. I mean, yeah. it's Logan a... Logan Webb goes down? Right. It's a weird strategy, but you've already made it this far. It's we a lottery also, ticket. That's not what Scott's waiting on. Scott's not What's going... No, Scott's waiting on some owner to get desperate. Well, yes, how does an owner get desperate? Uh, just, just, hey, this guy's still out there. We can steal him. Yes. He's not... They're not... They're not... You're not... As much as people are like, oh, there's a competition in camp. There's not a competition in... The Phillies aren't looking at Johan Rojas' BP and his first five games going, I don't think so. Let's go get Cody Bellinger. They know what they have. As much as people are like, best shape of my life, all this stuff, you're not really in competition in spring training for positions that are that are going to be filled by the free agents that are still out there. Yeah. I don't know. It, it just – it, this probably isn't going to happen I, I, for numerous reasons. The signing no, deadline? The signing deadline. No. So, I mean, it's kind of – but it's it's just it's just interesting, the timing of when he said it. And plus he's retiring. So, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all positioning. It's all posturing. It's all for the bargaining in a couple years. And Not getting players signed this late, though, is bad for the game. Agreed, especially when it's like four of the top free agents yes. in, in the whole sport. Not having those four. I mean, how is Jordan Montgomery, who was like the best pitcher in the postseason last year, not signed? Blake Snell won the Cy Young. He was the best pitcher in the National League last year. He's not signed. Cody Bellinger had one of the best years offensively, not signed. I think part of I think part of what is going on too, teams are afraid of offering Scott Boris a contract. Like, they don't want to sit there and go, Scott, I mean, Ken kind of hit on it the other day. I think it was on Monday. He hit on it. Like, if if they offer somebody an extension, they'll be like, oh, okay, cool. Thank you. I'll take that information. Like, so does – are there even any contract offers out there? We talked to Josh Hader the other day. He had one legitimate offer. Teams are afraid of offering these guys because of – how that sets the market for what an agent is going to take it and go, oh, okay, well, this is what the offer is. Now I'll shop this mark. Now I'll shop this offer. Correct. Mm -hmm. The process has gotten super weird and annoying. It's not as fun anymore. It's, it's meticulous. This is the once in a lifetime chance for these players who are the elite players in the world to hit free agency. And you work so hard to get to free agency. A deadline can't happen, won't happen. And Boris is not, as much as he's trying to get the most for that client, he's like an owner. He's trying to get the most for his next client also because he knows if he can up the bar for Blake Snell, his next three Cy Young free agent, three-time Cy Young free agent who has better numbers than Blake Snell will get more. But there has to be teams for you to, to get. To it takes two to tango. There has to be teams for you to get that kind as of I, As Kratz, as I've said, and, and people always I use the analogy, your house you might think is worth $20 million, <laughs> and you put it on the market for $20 million, and you get 10 offers for $2 million, and you're like, well, damn, it's worth 20 in my mind. And then you get another 10 offers for $2 million. Guess what your house is worth on the market? $2, two million. million. So you better take the $2 million and get out if you need to. The right? difference so in your... If you're Blake Snell and you're Scott Boris, and, and listen, I'm all for players getting every dollar, but if the Yankees say, hey, you're worth 5 125 just throwing random numbers out there, and then you're like, oh, they made this offer, and then you go to every other team, they're like, we ain't beating that one, then guess what? You better take the 5 125 or they're going to be like, as we all know, I'm retired, Kratz retired, every player we have on here is retired. The game goes on. Mm -hmm. And if Blake Snell doesn't pitch this year, guess what? Baseball's still going to be played. It's still going to be awesome. It'd be better with Blake Snell in his prime, but. My thing is there's not that many teams that care about going after these remaining players. Is that accurate? There's, okay. there's where you I want just, to put my effort into. Dude, we just had Shai Davidi on. Ross Askin spoke in the last day or two. And his comments, I always like to say paraphrasing so no one comes after me, <laughs> were <laughs> <laughs> that they're not adding. Unless they're subtracting, right? 
And he didn't just mean position, he meant payroll. So if there's some trade that emerges, cool. But I think he said it without saying it because you're not allowed to say this. It's against the rules of the sport. We're not signing Matt Chapman unless he's suddenly cheap as fuck and he's on one of those one-year deals. We're talking to Mustakis later. He was actually a part of this at one point. We might be able to ask him. You know what I'm saying? And it actually worked out really well for him. He signed that one-year deal. He had the qualifying offer from the Royals, right? And then he said no, and then he ended up signing back with them. Had a great year, then signs with the Reds for, I think, four years, 60. So it worked out for him. But that could happen again. And that's where a team could jump in. But if not, the impression I got from a team like the Blue Jays was, we're good. Off season's over. We're done. We're not signing dudes to 50, 100, 150. No fucking way. We're done with that. And so if they're done, now we cross them off. There's not that many teams left. It's the same two teams we keep talking about. The Cubs and the Giants. They're not signing six dudes. Right? They're not signing six. Maybe years. one each, and it would be maybe one each, right? Maybe the Cubs get Bellinger back. Maybe the Giants sign Snell or Montgomery. They're not signing both. Competition. Competition is what should be. we should focus our energy on. Not a trade, a deadline, signing deadline, or competition. Make sure every team wants to compete. And if they're not competing... Give me your three-year, two-year window of why you're not competing this year. Like, what happened? Oh, we lost this player. We don't have this revenue. Like, be upfront about it. The competition part. There should be more teams that are in the mix for Matt Chapman, for Jordan Montgomery, for Cody Bellinger on a, you know, a one-off year that he just had. So – we can do this because it doesn't take long, even though there are a lot of teams in the league. Just, just look at, just type in like MLB standings in Google, okay? Just so you can pop up the teams or MLB teams and just sift through, okay? When you do that, you're like, who is spending big still at this point? You know, that's the problem. Do it real quick, okay? Baltimore, not likely until that sale gets done. Tampa Bay, never. Toronto just said they're done. Yankees, sure, maybe. It sounds like they already had some combos with Snell, and that's still a possibility if the price comes down. Boston, broke. Twins, broke. (laughs) Tigers, done. Cleveland, broke. Sarcasm here. A little bit, not that much. He's role-playing. Yeah. Let him go. White Sox, rebuilding. Royals, done. And did well. Good for them. Houston, gone. Rangers, Rangers TV. are the one they're waiting on the TV deal, but they would go Montgomery over. Snow. That's where Monty's going. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where he. I think he's wanted to go, but I mean, it's a little, a little questionable there. I mean, Hater said the the call was we got weird TV money shit going on. We're not really doing anything mm-hmm. crazy. So okay, we'll see. And they they won, and they did some things. They need yeah, to start. If they picture. don't, Continue I know they need Seattle one, broke. But... Oakland definitely yes. Angels, I have no idea what's going on with the Angels at this point. I I can't figure them out. I don't know what they're going to get somebody. (laughs) You would think so. I just I don't know, you know, which side of the pillow Artie wakes up on over the next month. That's really how it goes. Payroll though. I know cutting payroll. But then you know, I think it was Heyman said like they're still like looking into some of these free. The Rangers payroll, their TV deal is done now. They figured it out. I know that's not an excuse anymore. I think now go to the National League. Giants are the one. Right, national. And the Cubs. Braves done. Phillies. Maybe. They get the right deal. Yeah. yeah. Miami broke. Mets next year. Nationals not yeah. ready and they're trying to get sold. Yeah. Brewers, I think done. Cubs. I'll give you one sec on the Cubs here. So someone wrote this the other day and I thought it was interesting. When it was Theo and Jed Hoyer, Theo was the aggressive. And Jed was the, hey, let's take it down a notch. Let's think about this. We need our prospects, whatever. So there's a little more um, safety in the Cubs front office these days. You know, like mm, if the price comes down, we're not doing anything crazy. Cincinnati done. Pittsburgh broke. I think St. Louis done. Mm -hmm. Dodgers, clap it up. You crushed it. Diamondbacks crushed it. Mm-hmm. I think they're done. Padres done, probably. Rockies! 
<laughs> Who? <laughs> Colorado. They have a full. They have a four A team. Derek just said in our chat. Still think M should sign Snell. Well, Derek, do you have one hundred fifty plus million dollars? Because the Mariners are not mm-hmm. giving out money. Plus like Snell that. tries to win too much. They're yeah. What? They're hoping to get a fifty four percent discount. Really? Mm-hmm. I mean, the the Mariners should have acquired Soto. They should have signed Solaire. They should have signed Snell. They're they're not operating like that. Here's what the like teams that. are doing. They're waiting for these players to panic. Yep. And then bring the prices down. But prices. still, only one team is going to get that one player. It's not like, ooh, I can't wait for if his I, price okay, to come. They don't I'm, care that much about these players. True. If I'm – Cody Bellinger did it last year. He did the one-year parachute deal with the Cubs, right? He had a great year, but it hadn't been signed. If I'm – you know, Blake Snell's a little bit older and his, his track record is a little more – if I'm maybe Montgomery, I'm thinking about doing that. Matt Chapman might need a one-year deal to bounce back. Chapman's the only one you can make a case in my mind. The other three have nothing to prove. Cy Young, true. playoff mm-hmm. stud – no, and Bellinger had a great bounce back year and already did the pillow contract. He's like, I got to do another one? Yeah. I'm just saying what their brain is going through. Chapman's the only one where you could say, he got an injury, he was really good in the beginning and then tailed off. I could I, see that. I would say Monty's the one that's the safest. I mean, I think yeah, we're splitting deal. hairs here, but I think Monty's the safest. Monty's going to get, because of his consistency, you know what you're getting. And I don't think his... Price is fluctuating too much. Maybe he's waiting to see what Snell gets. Or maybe, you know, I, I think Monty is the one that won't sign a one-year pillow contract. But Bellinger, what, do, what are you getting? I mean, I think I think Bellinger's more of a roller coaster than Blake Snell is. And Chapman, I think consistency with Chapman, whatever you pay him, you know you are getting elite defense. Whether you think he's worth a hundred million or you think he's worth a one year twenty million or whatever the whatever the um, the franchise tag is, whatever whatever that is, you know that's what you could get him at. I don't know, but to me, I think Monty's the most the most secure. And I'm going to go against some people in the chat that are saying the Cubs don't show safety or a conservative route. They overpaid for counsel. Guys, they what paid a couple million extra for a manager when manager salaries have been suppressed? That's it not the best going one. wild. Cubs gone wild. They they spent. Mm. Do you know how much Craig Council costs? The same amount essentially this year as Jacob Junis for the Brewers, their fifth starter. So that's not the same. Going wild would have been signing Sneller Montgomery, bringing Bellinger back, Chapman. Oh, just signing all four of them. That's going. That's, that's going. going you, know what that's, you know what that is? That's what? full throttle. That's full throttle. Some teams that were expected to be aggressive this offseason just weren't. The Cubs that's were all. the main one that everyone thought was, and and even the Blue Jays to an extent were thought to be. Yeah. Possible, and the Red Sox obviously were one that they were everyone yep. was thinking of. So, but I mean, the Yankees made their move with with Soto, right, and Stroman. Those were their moves. Right, the Dodgers obviously blew it up with Otani, Yamamoto, Teoscar. They went wild. All of them. They yeah. In Arizona, Eduardo Rodriguez, you know, Genie Suarez, and they made some moves. Jock Peterson. So listen, I, I just don't know. That's why you know agents agents are get paid a lot of money because they got to figure this out. It's like puzzle pieces, right? It's like all right, how do we fit? How do I find a team that can fit Bellinger and Snell? And then, and you're also like, if you have Montgomery and Snell, and you have one team. Are you bidding them against each other? He deals with that all the time. Though. But you know what I'm saying? I know. Like, let's say, let's say the Yankees call him, or let's say the Giants call him and say, "Hey, we got one spot. We want a left-handed starter. You have Snell and Montgomery. Will either one of them take five years, one fifty? Hmm. Then you then you call them both and say, "Hey, they offered this. Well, either one of you take it. What Who if they you call first? That's that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Hmm. That, that's what I'm saying. And then what happens if they? What if they both go? I'll take it. Then what? And you call back and say they both want it, and then the team decides. It'll mm-hmm. be a good question to ask Moose. Moose is uh, Boris' client. Yeah. How, Sounds like how AJ's you... role playing a lot now, though. I no, I'm just stating. I'm just stating what would happen. Like if you're if you're if you're Scott Boris, and the Giants call you and say we got one spot, and it is a left-handed starter. We'll take either one. Here's the numbers. And you got no other calls from any other team. Which one do you call first? Let's say you call Jordan Montgomery. He says, I'll take it. Then you call Blake Snell, and he says, well, I'll take it too. Oh, well, shit. Montgomery already said yes. 
You put them on a three-way, three-way call and say, all right, guys, here's the deal. Who says yes first? They're like, yes. You're like, shit. All right. And it's like Jeopardy who hit the button first. Beep, 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 beep. What is yes? I'll take that, Alex, for 300. I don't, I don't know. It's just, it's just a weird. It is. All right. I got one more free agent for you because Ken Rosenthal wrote a story in the past few hours about Tim Anderson and that the Marlins made an offer. Now, this is the problem with everything we're talking about here. We just don't know what the offer is. If we knew what offers were for people, we could dissect them and be like, oh, that sounds legit or, oh, a million, whatever, right? So Tim Anderson is coming off a terrible year. I'm sure he would say the same, right? It was brutal for him um, on and off the field. And the one thing I will say about on the field is he had a great WBC. He had a good first two weeks in the bigs, and then he got hurt. He had the knee issue. He went on the aisle for about a month. And he just, he was never the same. He finished like a little better, but he had a brutal, brutal year. Look at his numbers this year versus the past. Yeah. I think he's going to bounce back. Why? Because he's better than last year and he's not 39. No offense, Kratz, because you're different, but he's going to be fine. So yeah, I think this would be a great move for the Marlins and for some others too. But this is your case of... Players like him, players like Whit Merrifield, who are legit major league all-star at times players who are not signed up yet. And that's the same thing, Kratz. Like we're we're talking about the big boys, like, oh, you know, is Snell gonna get 150? Oh, he turned that down because he wants 200. He's gonna have to give in and take his one something. This is like, is Tim Anderson getting an offer for more than a few million bucks right now? I Why not? So. I hope so. I think, I mean, if you're going to pay, if I were to guess with the Marlins, based on the amount of money that they're supposedly allowed to spend, I would bet, I would bet it's probably a $6 million contract. If, if you as a player think you're an $8 million player because he's a starting shortstop in the big leagues, I say that without explaining it, that is a big deal to start and play 160 games at shortstop in the big leagues. I think 6 million at some point TA would, would sign that. And I think mm -hmm. the Marlins off season would come to an exhausting close and they could go on to their season. And I think he'd be a big piece. And there are two guys batting titles in the same lineup. Whew. It would be their first big league signing of the off season. <laughs> they would finally do it. They'd I'm be not like, being sarcastic. The Oakland A's would text them and be like, Welcome to the club, guys. You signed up for Major League Free Agent. I'm not I don't know. Being I, listen, I think I, I, Tim Anderson has been a really good player. People knock him for his defense. He only hit one home run, I know, last year. Um, but it's just amazing he hasn't been signed yet. I mean, this is a this is a guy that's won batting titles and done a bunch of things in the big leagues. And remember the WBC, man, they were pumping this dude up. Um but gosh, dog, man, I was, I mean, this is the guy, like when we talk about, you know, Boris Chapman, you know, Bellinger, Snell, like Boris four, like, this is a guy you're like, how is he not signed? Cause you know, he's not asking for the world, right? He's just asking maybe for a chance. So I don't know. I think this fits. And I think Tim could have a big year. I agree. And this is a buy low candidate. That's what happens here. But the Marlins so far have said, we are perfect. We don't need anything. <laughs> They've done a lot behind the scenes, but like Ken said on our show multiple times, those are two different cases. Second base for the Angels. Ron Washington, he can get he gets everybody hyped to play. Perfect Trip. fit. I, I'm not even being sarcastic about that this time. No, no, it's real now. No, yeah. I mean that's see, that's something that would make sense. It would make sense. That actually would make sense for the Angels to do, so they won't do it. They think they're good. It's Ohapia catcher. Cool. Like it. Shanwell at first. I'm not sure. Uh, Drury, Renhifo, Rendon, Neto is essentially your infield. They don't love Drury every day at one position. I like they him love, everywhere. They love him moving around. Yeah, he's, a, yeah. he's a utensil good. guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. I feel the same way win. to an extent about Renhifo. I feel like those two. I know I know some fans love him. I, I think he's good. I don't know. Is he a first division infielder for you? 
man, he put together a great second half. I know. Great second half. Like, and it looked it looked real. Like it looked like a like a Willie Ibar kind of type of player. Like that type of production. I don't mm-hmm. know. I Okay. All right. It'd be interesting. I think Tim Anderson fits perfectly there, but so we're going to talk to Mike Mustakis in a few minutes. Oh, he's coming up in a sec. So I'm, uh, you want me to just give you the little a- A's update? I, I saw. Yes, please. I give hope it's people. for reals. For reals. I hope so too. I mean, it's it's Scott Osler from the San Francisco Chronicle. He said the mayor's office and MLB have had preliminary talks about the possibility of Oakland being guaranteed an expansion team in return for the city giving the A's a lease extension at the Coliseum. It looks like Oakland is trying to get John Fisher to sell his 50% stake in the Coliseum. He owns half of that site. The A's have $70 million from Comcast on the line. Right, we know that. And Oakland's trying to play hardball and want to guarantee him an expansion team to allow the A's to stay at the Coliseum for the next three years. Good for them. Mm-hmm. As, that is exactly what they should do. That is the only conversation that should be had. There's nothing else that's going to convince them to say, yeah, sure, thanks for screwing us over. Now take our ballpark for another few years. No, you deserve an expansion team. You go get one. That's it. Otherwise, there's not much to talk about. So I'm glad that they're sticking up for the city. And I hope that all this is real. And also, I don't know how to do this because I'm not smart enough, but I hope that you have the best freaking lawyers and government officials to make sure that when they tell you that you're getting an expansion team, that it's real and there are no loopholes. Hmm in that conversation that they can't pop up in 2028 and say, oops, but section 23 part four actually says blah, blah, blah. And we're not giving you a team. If a new mayor is in town right, and the deal is off. I just would have a lot of trust issues based on what's happening. Also, I think that the A's, if they do move to Vegas and they get an expansion team, it should be the Oakland A's and the, New team in Vegas can come up with their own freaking logo. Yeah, so. we're helping the league on that one, okay? I'm telling you, rebranding is good for a team that's entering mm-hmm. a new city. That's a given, okay? We're going to have uh, Mike Moustakis joining us in just a sec. Um, he just signed a deal with the Chicago White Sox. Which I thought it was the Kansas City Whites or the they, Chicago Royals. What did you call them yesterday? Yeah, what do we call them? Wait, don't give it away. Don't say anything. Because I okay. think cause he's in the green room, so he's going to be able to hear him. I don't want him to hear our jokes. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be great. It'll be great. Do you know the last time that we spoke to him? April. He just randomly popped up in a Phillies dugout. And I'm like, bro, I didn't even know you were coming in town. I would have hooked you up with some golf. As he's an my, angel. He's my, he's my guy. He'll hook me up with some golf. And I hope he calls me when he needs some golf. I think I did it one time for him in Pittsburgh. There's some good courses. As much as you bag mm-hmm. on PA Jersey area, AJ, great golf courses. And my guy Moose stripes them all. I mean, I don't know how you do that when you're a player, when you're playing, but I guess he's a bit more of a bench guy now. It'd be easier. As when he was player. starting, he was out there in the morning. I, I don't know how he did it. He's He's one of the only – Productive hmm. position players that would golf on days of games. Impressive. That is impressive. So he'd golf, go back, take a nap, jump on the bus. Wow, I don't know how he does. Gosh, because I mean, I was I, I you know you get home at the, from these games, you go to bed, especially on the road at like one, twelve, one o'clock, and then you know you need your sleep, so that wasn't enough time for me to do it. That's why that was working. People were like you played all the time on the road. I'm like. No, I didn't have time. I played every off day. Days. Yeah, off but even days. off days were so precious. It was it was hard. I love golfing on off days. Turn your phone off and just be out on the course for four hours. Do you guys turn your phone off and go out on the field for hours every day? No, that's different. Why? Because you're trying to perform. What does that have to do with the phone? I mean, at least you're getting away from the technology. Most people are staring at screens all day every day in their jobs these days yeah it's different though off day you turn your phone off if you have if you don't if you're not golfing on an off day in the big leagues peeps are hitting you up oh hey i saw it was your off day hey do you want to talk about this hey mm-hmm. haven't talked for a while i saw it was your off day 
It's <laughs> like they wait for your off day and you're like, well, actually, I'm waiting for my off day. I took the family <laughs> to the zoo. So then you text back, off season is when we can <laughs> converse. <laughs> off season, I meant, not off day. All right, let's bring in Mike Moustakis of the Chicago White Sox. <laughs> joining us on FT Live right now. Yeah, I, I like the nod. How does that sound, dude? Uh, sounds good, man. Sounds really good. Been a, been a long time coming, so I'm excited to finally uh, be over there. Well, long time coming. Had you guys been chatting for a bit this offseason? Yeah, you know, I've, me and Getsy go way back, and uh, we've been talking about uh, over the last four or five years about, uh, you know, finding a way to get over to Chicago, and uh, finally glad it's happened. Wait, isn't so that tampering? <laughs> <laughs> Because you've been playing the last four or five years, and uh, so first case of tampering, agent. Chris gets. I've been a free agent the last four or five years, uh, Kratzy, so. <laughs> Wait, well, so was- now, congratulations. Welcome to the, what is it, the Chicago Royals or the Kansas City White Sox? What is it? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, it's uh, it's fun, man. It's uh, it's going to be exciting. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be over there. Uh, obviously, got to go out and make a team, but uh, it'll be a lot of fun. What do they tell you? What do they tell you? Because there's so many times we see big league vets, World Series champion, all-star, Mike Moustakis signs a minor league deal. Well, if he makes the team. Uh, if he may- Way different than if this, if this guy signs a minor league deal. Like, have, have, fun, in, have fun in AAA. You, what, what does that mean and what do they tell you? Like, is there really a competition? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm going into it uh... – you know, with the expectations of going out and trying to make a ball club, uh, nothing, uh, nothing's been given uh, by any means. And you know, uh, you know, last year is kind of the same way. I went into Colorado on a uh, uh, non-roster invite and uh, ended up making the team out of camp. And I'm going with the same mindset this year. I got to go uh, win a spot on a on a major league team, and that's uh, definitely something that's not easy to do. Moose, do you know what your spring training? career batting averages <laughs> i think it's pretty good i'm not i'm not so sure what it is but i mean that's that's in the past man you know how it goes it's a new year it's a, that's obnoxious so if you're going to if you're going to <laughs> i i gotta pull it up to make sure i have the right numbers here but if you're gonna m- need to make a team what does that actually look like because i had plenty of seasons in spring trainings where i hit 410 didn't make the team i had spring trainings where i hit 180 made the team Ah, sweet. So what does that look like for you? You know, that's uh that's a conversation uh we're gonna have to have with uh you know Pedro and uh and Getsy and you know all the guys and seeing what they're uh, they're asking of me. And I, I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is, is going out there and being myself, being uh you know, the the player I've been in the past and uh, you know now that I am a, a little bit older and a little bit uh more of a veteran going out there and you know showing guys how to do things the right way and uh, kind of being more of a, of a leader aspect and doing my job and knowing what my role is. So, uh, you know, all of those things, uh, you know, obviously all uh, come together and we'll be in a pretty good spot. What is, what, I don't know, what did they tell your role is going to be? Because you look at first base, they got a first baseman, they got a third baseman, they got a DH. You ain't going back to second, I don't think, maybe. I mean, you, I mean maybe, no. you know, we're, we're spryer no. now in our old age. So what, yeah, what do they say here? I mean, um, what did they say your role was going to be? I think it'd be the same as it was in Colorado. Um, and, you know, in the early parts of Anaheim is uh, adding adding a little bit more depth, uh, being able to, uh, you know, play first, third, uh, occasionally DH when, when needed. Um, but getting comfortable in, in a role and knowing who you are as a player, um, obviously I'm, I'm not uh, the guy I used to be. And – Uh, being able to play every single day, going out there for 155, 162 games, uh, being able to, you know, accept your role as who you are and going out there and filling that role the best you can. And I felt like I did a pretty good job of that last year uh, in Colorado and in Anaheim. And, uh, you know, I'm expecting to, uh, you know, have that same role, being able to, you know, pinch hit late in games or things like that. Moose, why do you think we joked about it, but – the White Sox have so many people coming in from KC. Obviously, Getz has that connection there. And I think he's been you know, pretty transparent about how they want to change the culture there. So I'm curious about your take on how that's happening and what KC has, what they've developed that he covets. 
Um, yeah, you know, uh, Kratzy can, can also attest to this. It's uh, the way we played baseball over there, uh, the way we cared about each other in the clubhouse. Uh, it was an accountability thing. You know, it didn't matter if you were the first guy, if you were the superstar, or if you were the 24th, 25th man on the roster. Uh, everybody held each other accountable. And uh, that went in the front office and the coaching staff uh, throughout the entire organization. It was an accountability thing. And, uh, you know, we a a lot of us have already been there and uh, and done that. And uh, to be able to come in and, you know, show these guys uh, maybe how how to do things uh, a little bit differently and maybe have a little bit more success uh, on on the field and going out and, you know, winning some more ball games. I mean, maybe maybe it'll help a little bit. And, um, you know, I think. Uh, gets he's done done a great job of surrounding himself with some some great uh, baseball minds and putting himself in a position to succeed uh, with this organization and get this team where where it needs to be. Hey Moose, some fans are asking about the Rockies because you spent some time there last year. How do you fix the Rockies and get them back on track? What did you like? And I know there's some good young talent. Uh, Nolan Jones is a stud, but you know what what are some problems that you observed there that you didn't see in other places where you were successful? Yeah, you know, that's just a young team over there. Um, you know, that's a great group of guys. It's one of my favorite teams I've I've ever been on. Um, like you said, they got a they got some great young talent. Um, but once they they figure out how to uh, you know perform at the major league level, um, they're they're going to be great. It's uh, you know, this game's not easy, and when you're young and you're learning how to do it at the big league level, it's uh, it's challenging. So they got some great young guys: Tovar, uh, Monty, obviously Nolan, and. Uh, you know, they got some great older players, too. I wouldn't say older, but uh, you got Mac and Freeland and some guys that, you know, uh, have been around now and can show these younger guys how to do things. I'm, I'm excited to see where they're at. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a fun team to watch in the, in the future. OK, well, then you were at the Rockies and you went to another team that seems tough. You know, you got to play with Otani and Trout. I mean, speak to us on Anaheim. Like they let Otani go. Obviously, they still have Mike Trout. They got some young players. So. What does Anaheim need to do to take the next step? Yeah, I think uh, I think kind of the, kind of the same way. There's uh, once once uh, everybody started getting hurt, you kind of saw how it all uh, unfolded. Um, but being able to play with Otani and uh, and Trout, it was it was awesome. You know, that's something you kind of dream of, uh, especially playing in my hometown. Uh, Got to stay at home, drive to the field every day, and uh, it, it was special. Um, but yeah, again, those guys, uh they they got some great young players, uh Nolan over at first base and uh Neto at short. They got some great guys, uh oh, Hoppy behind the plate. Um once once they once they, you know, get their at bats in the big leagues, they're gonna be just fine. I think that's a great team. Uh obviously you have one of the greatest baseball players to ever play in Mike Trout. Um he's he's still there and he's not gonna he's not gonna change. He's still gonna be the best player on the field every time he steps on it. Um so it's 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 I think I think they're in a good spot, uh, but again, they just gotta they gotta you know get their at bats uh, and and keep going. It's it's how it is in the big leagues. You guys know how it goes. All right, he's Mike Trout because he's the best player in the game. But when you guys are just hanging out, he's just Jersey Mike. Exactly. You talking to Jersey Mike? Can you say to him, dude? Why why wouldn't you like ask out? Would he would he ask out of Anaheim ever? to go somewhere and not try to be part of the rebuild that you just said, these guys need at bats, not competing to be in the world series, but they need at bats. Why do you think he would never do that? Uh, because he wants to win in Anaheim. He's a loyal guy. You know, Mikey, uh, he's loyal. He wants to win there. I mean, he's, uh, he's such, he's such a great dude, such a loyal human. Uh, and I mean, obviously one of the best players to ever do it. So, I think it'd mean more to him if uh, if and when they're able to win over there. I think that uh, it, it means more to him than going somewhere else and, and trying to win. Okay, so you just talked about Mike Trout being in one place for one time, trying to win over there. You guys won in Kansas City. They never gave anybody. I guess Salvador was the one guy they gave kind of the long extension to. Why did they not give you or Hosmer or – I mean, I guess Alex Gordon got a nice deal, but, like, why did they not – Pony up like they did with Bobby Witt. They just gave Bobby Witt this huge deal. Why do you think they didn't give you those? Those you guys those? That's a that's a question you got to ask Dayton and uh, all those front office guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ask them in Chicago. Uh, You're going to Chicago. Yeah, I mean they're all in the Chicago. Box. You can ask them all. <laughs> yeah. I, listen, I uh, 
you know, I love Kansas City. Um, you know, I, I love that city. I love everything about Kansas City. Um, but obviously, baseball is baseball. It's a business. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, we just didn't we didn't fit into the plans that they had in the future. And, you know, I understood that. And, you know, um, going forward, obviously, we've had a had a pretty good career and got to be in some really cool places, played with some great players. Um, and I'll always be thankful to Dayton in that front office and the Royals organization for giving me a chance to play. Um, and then on the other side of that, you know, Bobby Witt is incredible. You know, what a, what a talented player he is. And uh, I'm excited to watch him in the future, man. That's going to be uh, – that's awesome, uh, you know, for him and that city and that organization. I'm excited for, uh, for everything. Hey, Moose, right now there's some big name free agents that are still hanging around. What advice would you give them? I mean, you went through a situation where obviously – you took less on a one-year deal, and then you signed a great contract with the Reds after that. But that one year is difficult for many people if it ends up getting to a point where they have to accept a pillow contract. And you then have to you know, take that, swallow your pride, perform, and then you know, play well next time around. Not saying that's going to happen with these guys, but just you experience that. So what do you think about when you see some of the big names that are sitting around? Yeah, you know, obviously I've been in that position. Um... And it's, it's not fun uh, going through it, but at the end of the day, you know, you know what you're capable of as a player. You know uh, how good you are and um, just going out there and, and, and playing to the best of your ability and, and, you know, proving it to not only yourself, but to everybody else. And, um, you know, it adds a little extra, maybe a little chip on your shoulder to go out there and, and uh, you know, play a little bit better, if that makes any sense. But, um you know, it, it's each person's situation is different. You know, mine was mine was different from some of these other guys, but uh, it's it's not it's not fun to sit at home and not have a job. Um, but once you get the job, you you put all that aside and you go out there and you go to work and uh, you go out there and try and win ball games for your team. And I mean, that's the best advice I I can give is once once you get your job, um, put all that other stuff aside and go out there get to work. When you went to Anaheim, I got one more Anaheim question because we talked when you came in to Anaheim and you were like, whoa, I get to see Shohei Otani all the time. What did you see from Anthony Rendon and not being, you know, kind of you guys kind of had the same position, you know, playing third base and you filling in there and you kind of dealt with your calf issue, but you played through it. What, what, what were you seeing from Rendon? Yeah, Tony's awesome, man. I love I love Tony. Uh, he uh he 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 was pretty banged up. I was on deck when he uh, fouled that ball off of his off of his shin, and it was it was pretty bad, man. And uh, just seeing how that all transpired, you know, um, it, it was it was rough to to watch. Uh, you know, a buddy of yours go down. I saw it happen with Yelly when I was in uh, um, Milwaukee. We were in Miami. He fouled the ball off his kneecap. And just watching your your boy go down and knowing he can't walk and get up, you know, it's tough. But uh, you know, Tony's a competitor. Um, I can't wait to see what he does this year. I'm, I'm excited. You know, we still talk. And uh, it, it's going to be fun to watch those boys play again, man. It's uh, it, it, Once they're all healthy and they're ready to go, you know, those are some of the best players in all of baseball. Hey, Moose, what do you think about the enforcement of the obstruction? Have you guys talked about it at all? Have you seen the news? I mean, it's a rule that's existed already, but the league wants to enforce it more with, you know, guys dropping – the leg down and to try and prevent injuries, I guess, and promote more aggressive base running. I mean, it's perfect conversation yeah. for you, for your take. I, yeah. I, uh, it's funny. I learn all the new rules when I get to spring training. So I haven't <laughs> even, <laughs> I haven't even looked at them yet. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'll learn those in a, in a little bit once I get out there, but, uh, you know, obviously player safety is huge. You want guys to, to be on the field and continue to play. Um, so it'll be, a It'll be good to continue to promote player safety, obviously. What about the uniforms? Have you heard anything? There's a lot of I talk, have, man. I haven't. Again, everything everything happens when you get to spring, man. I, I get sure. all the new rules, all the all the uniforms, all that new stuff. So those those first three, four days of meetings are pretty important for me because I gotta figure out what what's going on. <laughs> Fair. When do you get to camp? Uh leaving tonight, actually. Uh you know, so had a day to pack, get everything ready to go, get all the kids uh, loaded up and ready to rock. That's that was going to be my question. 
Dude, you were taking some trips this offseason. How do you do that with the absolute brood of kids that you have? Yeah, uh, well, that that lady right there, uh, Stephanie, she does it all, man. You know how it is. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I got to marry her, and uh, it's been uh, been awesome. We married for ten years now, and she's she's incredible. Uh, I think that's my daughter's dance trophy right there. That was pretty special. We went to Anaheim. She got a dance trophy. Um, but yeah, without without her, I wouldn't be able to continue to do this. And she pushes me every single day. Uh, in, in the best ways to keep to keep going and keep getting better and uh it's been a lot of fun man it's uh it's been a roller coaster of a ride you know playing major league baseball and all the travel but she's a she's a champ so it's it's awesome and i'm lucky to have her a lot of private jets no private jets you can't no private, private jets. jets for five no private you got a hundred no. people you you look like a you look like a rapper with your entourage coming around and a dog <laughs> and a dog and a dog <laughs> and a dog <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you got all the pictures up there. They're on Insta. Hey. They look great, dude. Right. Steph, Steph is posting that, John. You know that. You better, be, you better go private. Yeah. You better go private <laughs> on there. I, I don't even have Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's got that good. She's, or still, she's, doing the, she's still doing her yeah. thing. She's still doing that. Uh, the jewelry, her, yeah. Good, yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. I appreciate that. Stephanie Mustak is fine jewelry. I love that. Thanks, Grant. Yeah, look it up. All right. Yeah, check, <laughs> Give it, a check plug. it out. Is that is that what it is? Love Stephanie Mustak yeah. is fine jewelry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff, man. The stuff's legit. You got you need to check it out. I uh, appreciate right, that. Kratz, yeah, that's my boy right there. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. So before we before Moose, before we let you go, I gotta ask this question. And you you can say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell the story, but I gotta. I'm gonna ask you about it, and if you don't want to tell the story, then I understand, because it's oh, kind no. of an embarrassing story. Do you know oh, the no. Tommy Lasorda story about you? No, 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 no. We're not. We're gonna hold that one. We're gonna hold is, that. I one just want to know: is it true? Is it true? Uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> oh, okay. That's all I needed. I'm not gonna tell yeah. the story because it's. It, there's a lot that goes into is it. Is it rated R? Yeah. It's 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 bad. But I just all I want to know on. is it's true or not. I'm not gonna tell it. I just want to know. Is Come it true on, Kratzy. I didn't know. I don't know this story. Kratzy doesn't even know. This. this is from other people. This is not from Kratzy. Oh, okay. All right. This no. is, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll tell these guys off the air. I can't tell it on the air. I just want to know yeah. if it's true. That's it. Yeah, it's funny because, um, you know, obviously growing up in L.A., Tommy's uh, a hero of mine. And, uh, you know, I got to meet him a bunch of times. So it's pretty fortunate for that. That's uh, it's it was awesome. It was awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's. That's it. I just yeah. wanted. I just wanted a confirmation. My All last, right. yeah. my last little piece here. This is my Mike Mustakis. We played 2010 in the Premundial. Mike Trout, yes. Eric Hosmer, Chris Archer, all those guys. Yes. Todd Frazier. How did you get on that team? You were had to be like <laughs> you were like 40 years old. They were all young. I was. We call it. I, he was grandpa. I was, was, I was the, <laughs> in that one. I was. I was the older brother in that one. And then when we played again later, I was their dad. But yes, that's exactly correct. Mike Mustakis got in an argument. I'm just going to say an argument with Danny Valencia in the clubhouse. And I heard this story from the Royals scout from one of the Royals people. After I got, I got traded from the Blue Jays to the Royals and they got rid of Danny Valencia because of the argument that him and Moose had Danny Valencia. He gone air Kratz, He's in. And now this year, Moose, I get to go to the 10 year anniversary of the American League Championship. Appreciate yeah, you, Moose. Yeah. Uh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate that as well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Good God, man. Jeez, also, Louise. an argument led to a long, a lifelong friendship. True. Yeah. We were, we you were lifelong take the friends before that. Yeah. There we were. Hey, Kratz, uh, when, when did that happen? What, when, what time of year was that? July. Oh, yeah. So. It was me and Danny are friends. It's, it yeah, yeah. happens in the clubhouse. Yeah. So, it happens I in mean, the clubhouse. Dude, yeah, happen, I mean, it happens every year in it almost every clubhouse. Time. Come no, on, if you don't get in a fight with your teammates, you're not friends. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't say a fight. Yeah. No, no, no. I didn't say well, a argument. Argument. Sorry. Argument. 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 argument, argument, verbal argument. Yeah, not a fight. fight. Argument. Yeah. No fights. Right. No fights. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. Just, I just want to say, Crutch. <laughs> Crutch. I guess you know you get to go to the ten year reunion. You know, you're lucky. I decided to sign with the Cardinals over the Royals that year because guess what? You wouldn't have had. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> We haven't heard that one. Because I was on the phone no, with no, Dave Moore thinking yeah, I was going to Kansas sign. City. And then uh, Matheny calls me the next the, that night, or Mosaic is like, hey, we'd rather 
would you come to St. Louis? Yachty got hurt. And I was like, ooh, Kansas City, St. Louis? I chose, I, chose, I chose poorly. Yeah, I could have been, been Kratz. Yeah. Look at me. I could have been Kratz. <laughs> Nobody and Kratz could have been you. We're all in the same place together. That's all that matters. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Kratz could have been you that. in St. Louis. Kratz oh, could have taken your spot. No, I would have stayed in AAA with the Blue Jays. <laughs> <laughs> well, Moose, awesome uh, to see you, dude. Congrats awesome. on the deal. We're excited to see Thanks, you in guys. camp, and then Thanks, we'll catch guys. you when we see you out there, right? Awesome. Sounds good, boys. Thanks for having me again. Hey, tell all the Appreciate boys there hello you. for me out in uh, the ranch in Glendale. Abs- absolutely, absolutely. Take care, boys. And hang out when you go Cheers. to Philly so we can get you some golf. Yeah. Mike Moustakis, leaving tonight, hitting camp. Love it. We got two things left to do, so let's flip through your NL likeliness for a pennant. Bet MGM odds. People are putting a lot of dough on the Dodgers. Mm. This is not World Series. This is pennant. I'll take the field. What's the field? For the pennant? Yeah. Dodgers are plus 180 to represent the National League in the World that's, Series. That's unbelievable. That is insane. Highest ticket, highest handle, biggest liability. I remember I asked Brian Bumgarner the other day, I'll take the field, and he wouldn't do it. Right. That was a different bet. Hmm. I mean, there are I mean, other teams that could take them down. Braves, Phillies, Diamondbacks did it last year. Yeah. All it takes is three games, you're hot. Or... Injuries, which happens oh, all the time. True. You lose a few big boys. I mean, I know they're pretty stacked. There's a lot of superstars, but you just never know. Every year, there's brutal injuries. Not saying it's going to happen with them, but Are they it's not like we're fight? going, oh, they didn't make the World Series. How? How does this team not make the World Series? There, there are, are other good say that. I know, but, the, dude, the, the Braves are a powerhouse. True. That is a very good team. True. True. That's it. That's all that's I got. That's your argument? I'm, hey, trust me. I love the Dodgers. And if I have to pick a team right now, that's probably who I'm picking. But the Braves are certainly capable. And Philly's so pitching the Philly. staff is still rated way higher. Which one? Phillies? Phillies. Top rated, top to bottom pitching staff. Fangraphs, Codify, all those hmm. groups. Okay. I mean, okay. Dude, is that, dude. Zach Wheeler for me in the playoffs. Not many guys better no. over the last Suarez. Ranger few years. Suarez has been really good. Ranger too. Suarez has had better numbers than everybody. Mm-hmm. True. And the one thing that the Phillies did so well, and this was actually a Dombrowski thing, was the Phillies had a brutal bullpen, and he had some of that. And Dombrowski's one bugaboo over the course of his career has been at times having a bad bullpen, even though he's had a ton of success, right? The Tigers had some issues mm-hmm. with their bullpen. Phillies had bullpen issues, and they fixed it. <laughs> their bullpen can stuff you, outstuff mm-hmm. you. Top to bottom. And it there's more coming. Matt yeah. Strong, Jeff Hoffman, freaking Dylan Covey. White Sox saying, didn't figure dude, him out. You're saying the guy's here. How about Sir That's Anthony I mean. Dominguez? Alvarado. How, how about Alvarado? How about Orion Kirkering? I'm talking about the bottom guys. That, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Top to bottom. Like you're you're pushing you're pushing some of those guys would be seventh and eighth inning guys for other teams. And they're 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 trying to find them work, which is going to keep them healthy, which is the whole point of getting into the playoffs, whether you have days off or not. How healthy are you? How used are you? Because then it's time to get going. And all of a sudden, if your starter has an issue, boom, fourth inning. You just go, boop, 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 bullpen, done. Game one, win, Braves. Ah, can't figure out what just happened. No, you're right. And Connor said, Phillies are going to trade for Will Smith at the deadline. He's going to be coveted. If the Royals aren't good, <laughs> everyone wants a piece of Will Smith because all he does is win chips. All right, place your first bet MGM Sportsbook wager through the app of at least five bucks. You will receive $150 instantly in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. Got to use the bonus code FOUL, F O U L, when you download the app and you're a new customer. Sign up and deposit at least five bucks into the account. Place a wager in the amount of at least five bucks at standard odds price. And once you place that bet, you'll receive $150 in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your wager. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1 800 Gambler. 
Okay, before we grade Krat hats, can we grade bronze threads? So I found this. These are fake, but it was funny, and I thought you guys would like it on a Friday. First look at Goldschmidt's new uniform. The letters are too big. <laughs> right, you need to make the letters smaller on your Photoshop. And also, I would just make it a full circle. I mean, It'd yeah. be great if they turned the birds around, too. If they turned them so they're facing the opposite way, just to see if people would pick it out. <laughs> they would. Nothing gets by anyone on uniforms, and it's been a fun week talking about mm -hmm. them. And it still says Majestic on it, so people, don't freak out. It's fake. It is fake, but it's fun. Kratz hats? Nice. Little, fro little throwback Friday? To me, that what has that? that has tough guy Mario vibes or Mario vibes. Mario, you mean like Mario. you mean like bad Mario? Yeah, which I guess is Wario, but Mario, Wario. Yeah. It's Milwaukee. Hmm. It's Milwaukee Brewers throwback jerseys. Freaking Eric Thames just hit like six homers just in this jersey. Hmm. Wow! All right, that's an A for me. Yeah, I like that one. I'm big on that one. It's got retro vibes. It's a badass M. That's an A for me. Anyone else good with that in the chat? Yeah, I like that one. That's an A. You it's know what it reminds me of? Remember last year how there's two teams that have a similar M? Like one team copied the other team's M? Wasn't oh, it like man. the Marlins have an M Minnesota. and the Mariners? Minnesota. Oh, Minnesota. Yeah. They look, they Minnesota they look like copied the look Marlins M. It was close, yeah. Yeah. Don't mention that to the Twins people, though. They get really They don't like pissed. that. Okay. No. When we go to Fort Myers, not talking about that. Say so, it. Say it with your chest. Yes. Oh, happy birthday to my friend Eric Burns. Next week, I can give you one. Hunter Pence joining the show for the first time. Hunter for Pence. For a little hangout session. And that's all I got. We're going to hit some uh, spring training camps. We are a week away from going to Oakland for Fans Fest to host a live show there and we will make an announcement about a time change to the show during spring training so that you can watch your spring training games we can talk to our players before that okay that's your little preview and that'll just be free certain time period we'll announce all of that next week happy friday peeps Subscribe.